Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 167. So glad you could join me. Uh, today's guest, David Bowles, is here. He'll be with us in about 10 minutes. But before we get in, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed, all that good stuff. Anything you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. Um, now, as always, we love to start with Poets Respond, and, uh, and we have two poets here today. We have um, Sunday's poet, who we'll talk to first. Sarah Etlinger is here with our second appearance on the Rattlecast in Poets Respond. Um, she had a really fun poem um, and, and moving poem called Haiku Di- or Hanukkah Dinosaur. And uh, here she is. Hey, Sarah, good to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got I've got haiku on the brain. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! Why don't you explain? Uh, why don't you explain okay. what it's about? Yeah. Well, obviously. So, for those of us who haven't seen it, there is like an actual Hanukkah dinosaur, and it's like those inflatable, and he's bright green, and it's actually found in a lot of places. But one is called Modern Tribe. dot com. So go there. They also have a banana menorah. Um, and I'm not making any of this up, but I saw it and it was, you know, in the context of like rising into feminism with Kanye and the LA bridge and God only knows, you know, Kiri Irving and all, the list is long. Um, I am Jewish and my friends who aren't Jewish know that I'm Jewish. Right. So, you know, I've been having all these little side conversations all the time. Like most of my friends just kind of asking me like, Hey, are you okay? Or, Hey, I'm really sorry that. Oh, she froze. Oh, yes. did this. And it was people coming in and I saw the dinosaur across the, the, my social media feed. And I sent it to people that I think it was funny because it's funny, but it kind of came together in a weird brain melt, um, especially in response to that. So, you know, and I think all my friends meant well, but there is tension in the, you know, in, in the poem, and I don't want to prescribe a reading, but I don't want anybody to be offended, but I also wanted to share my experience of looking at social media, di- so, uh, looking at social media feeds of inflatable dinosaurs that are probably eight feet tall, and, you know, the internet and the stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of the poems this week were about uh, Kanye West, his comments, and, and the sort of rise of that kind of sentiment. I think um, Kyrie Irving, too, didn't he say? Yes. Did, yeah. And yeah, like he, the basketball player, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's everywhere. Like the thing about the Bob, there's a Bob who exists, and he and I talk a lot. And one of the things that we're saying is like, it's not that it wasn't always there, right? Mm-hmm. Because people, will, they won't say that. Like, they won't say that, and, but, like, you'll see jokes or comments that I'm like, I don't think they know that I'm Jewish, hmm, you know, in yeah. some places, or I don't think they realize what that is. Most of the time, they don't get it. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, I'm going to say this, you know, and so the way, so it's always been in the background. I think it's just getting more traction now because of all kinds of reasons. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. good explanation for this poem. Let's let's hear it. Hanukkah dinosaur. All right. Dinosaur. Hanukkah dinosaur. Yeah. Judaism is trending again, my friend Jared tells me. So I wonder if I should buy Dinaka, the inflatable Hanukkah dinosaur, who is bright green with a blue t-shirt, cartoon menorah blazing on the front, and a big blue dreidel lying on its side. He wears a white yarmulke, which you can only see from the back. Everything is lit from the bottom. Imagine, I respond, you too can have a Hanukkah dinosaur in your front window or yard. I want him the way adults want things to remind themselves they were once children. I do not buy him. Lately, people are asking me if I've noticed how anti-Semitism is getting worse or if I think people aren't afraid of anything anymore. Bob asked me quietly and is very concerned. Last week, I told him, do not read any of the tweets or the headline in the New York Times calling a blatant attack on the Jews purported anti-Semitism instead of what it actually was actual anti-Semitism. Do not, I said, think harder about the Jewish space lasers or the LA Bridge protesters or Adidas. Another friend texts me about Kanye West and says he's a fucking asshole looking for more power. 
And I say, yeah, but we took down our mezuzah th this week for the first time ever. She is silent for several minutes before she tells me about the football game. She doesn't know what to do or say about any of this. They all want something different from me. And when someone asks what they can do, I want to tell them to buy this dinosaur so I can rig them up on my small, unruly yard for everyone to see as they pass by on their way to elsewhere as they whiz past warm, glowing plastic faces of the tiny Juan Jesus and Mary and Joseph, Ding dingy lambs weary at the end of the shepherd's crook, the molded shepherd's face hidden by his modest plastic cloak, the dinosaur bright and garishly green, proud and smiling instead of somber, a wholly joyful amalgam, two ancient entities older than all this grass and pavement and even this darkening sky, its hollow core, full of air and light quietly humming. Yeah, wonderful, Bobby. I love that ending especially. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a Hanukkah Dinosaur by Sarah Ellinger. Thanks so much, Sarah, for joining us. And, Thanks and for having me and for doing this. I'm so yeah. glad you gave this weird little poem. Uh-oh. <laughs> for sure. Well, it's always a pleasure. Good Thank to you. see you again. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Bye. Yep, bye. Yeah, that was uh, Sarah Ellinger with a Hanukkah Dinosaur. And now we don't have a uh, video, but we have Danny Mask here. Um, I think Danny said his camera's broken. But uh, hey, Danny, you're there. He got to unmute. Hmm. Let's see if we, if we can't get Danny because he was trying uh, on his phone. Oh, there he comes. Can you hear me now? Hey, Danny. Yeah, good to hear from you again. How you doing? Doing good. So you have tomorrow's poem. And uh, no one's read this one yet. It's one of your, your uh, sort of a, a Danny Mass. For people who are familiar and, and longtime listeners, Danny's done the uh, open lines and things like that for a long time. So we know his style, and um, which is short, concise poems with a title on the bottom, which is always fascinating, too. Um, but this is a poem for tomorrow, which is Election Day in, in the United States. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about what the, how the poem came to be without going into too much detail, maybe, Danny? <laughs> First, I want to say this is not a 17-line poem. This is really a short poem for mm -hmm. me. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess to, re to, to recap how the poem got, got its roots, I guess I usually graze the Internet for articles before I go to bed. In Atlantic most magazine mostly. And the night before early voting um, last week, I read The Joy of Voting and the Atlantic magazine and a list of uh, what makes Americans happy. And of course, s sex was the number one answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next morning during our morning ritual of bathing and eating, uh, we were getting ready to go vote early and I gave my wife a hug and I asked her a silly question. Uh, what makes you the happiest, uh, having sex or voting? <laughs> and one thing led to another. Um, along with sex, we did go vote afterwards, though. So. <laughs> yeah. Voting is very important, kids, especially yeah. now. Keeping yeah. our democracy whole depends upon you. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is, Danny. So so I love uh, – I just love your short, the concise style you do and the um, – and the, the title on the bottom, which uh, you ex explained last time, but it was so um, – so the poems feel more like paintings, which is fascinating to me. That's a really cool concept. Yeah. And it's such a strange convention yeah. to put the title on top. There's really no reason we do it the way we do it. So it's neat to see you do it the way you do. What, what, Tim, what did you find compelling about this poem? What did I find? So you're going to interview me. So I, I loved um, the, the – well, maybe we, should, maybe we should read the poem first, and then I'll tell you what. what how about why don't you do that? Yeah. This is the day, so says the curtain that darkens the room as we lay on the floor like wet towels with our mouths full of each other. Yeah. Election day. Election day. Yep. The title at the bottom. And uh, and so what I loved, I love the simplicity of it. And I loved um, that, that image of the wet towels. Uh, which is just a yeah. perfect little concise metaphor. It's one of those poems that yeah. works in sort of a one-level metaphor. And then, and then though, the, our mouths full of each other, which um, is maybe maybe a subtle thing to say, but but the way our politics work, the way the, the divisive nature of it, the polarization yes. that we have, our mouths are kind of full of each other. Like we're all telling each other that we're yeah. awful, you know. And so that that in a way made the poem really interesting too. In, in just seven short lines, um, so I found that poem fascinating. 
So you you think there is a double entendre in here? I definitely do. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't going for that, but I, but it works. It does. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, it was all about the curtain. You know, I, I don't know why they use these big, heavy curtains, but um, I just remember that curtain, that big old curtain. And uh, so when I got home, that's where the whole thing started mm -hmm. was uh, why I don't know why it needs to be so dark when you vote. You yeah, know? <laughs> that curtain was so animated. Uh, so I, I saw it had a lot of life. And uh, that's how that's how the poem got started. Yeah, well, and to me, the funny part about it is a, it works in three three very strong images, which is always a, a plus too. So yes. there's the curtain, there's the yes. towels, and then there's the mouths. Yeah. I, see, I usually start with story and imagery, and um, that's usually my focus. Mm -hmm. And I rarely care about structure or music musicality. Yes, and it's so funny that the two couplets are in iambic pentameter. And I never do that. <laughs> well, yeah, very cool little poem. And it's a good uh, reminder of what day it is tomorrow for everybody that gets that, the, the 13,000 or whatever people who get that in the mail tomorrow. Well, you'll vote, everybody. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's funny Thanks, thing. We Jim. have a storm blowing in. And I didn't do my pre-absentee ballot or whatever, the, the mail-in. Because I'd like, oh, I love going Jim. to the polling place. So I'm going to have to trek. Um, through the, a literal blizzard, there's like a foot of snow coming. No, nope. um, but I'm gonna no trek, excuses. Trek down there. Yep, exactly. So uh, wear your Danny little snowshoes. <laughs> yep, will too. Your snowshoes. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Danny. Thanks so much for joining us again. As always, always a pleasure oh, talking best, to you. Buddy. Thank you so much. Yep. Have a good night. Yep. yep that was Danny Mask with uh, Election Day. Tomorrow's poem of the day on Rattle.com. We're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest, David Bowles. So sit tight, um, listen to this bumper music here, and I will be right back with David. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Uh, today's guest, David Bowles, is a Mexican-American author and translator from South Texas, where he teaches at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. He has written over two dozen award-winning titles, most notably They Call Me Guero and My Two Border Towns. His work has also been published in multiple anthologies, uh, plus venues such as the New York Times, Strange Horizons, Rattle, back in Rattle number 47, um, a whole bunch of other stuff. He's also worked on several TV and film projects, including Victor and Valentino from the Cartoon Network, on um, Moctezuma and Cortez miniseries on Amazon, and Monsters and Mysteries in America from Discovery Channel. And uh, here he is, David Bowles. Hey, David, how are you doing? Pretty good, Tim. It's good to, to be here with you. It's great yeah. to see your face and be chatting about poetry, man. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. It's really cool to, to talk to you. I mean, you are maybe one of the most prolific writers, not just poets, that we've published or, or had on the get on, on the podcast in a long time. Um, I mean, you do, you've done, you mentioned two dozen books over the last like decade and a half. Um, yeah. But it's all sorts of genres. Um, it's, um, you know, it's it's novels and verse, um, young adults. Um, there's the the whole run of um, ghost stories and, and that kind of mythology that you've done too. Um, it's just a really cool, like a really broad spectrum of stuff that you've been writing. Um, and your most recent book, um, which just came out in September, 
is the sequel. It's they call her Fergona, um, which is the the next book, the the, the sequel to um, they call me Guero. Um, do you want to start by reading a little bit and uh, talking a little bit about that book? Yeah, sure. Um, let me just read a couple of the first poems um, from the like epil- uh, from the epilogue from the prologue <laughs> at the beginning. It would, I'm I'm doing like Danny. I'm starting at the you know I'm putting the title at the very end. Um, so border snow, and you're in the middle of a snowstorm. It doesn't snow very often down here, and when it does, it's a really, really big deal. Evening becomes dark night, unusually hushed and cold. Our house stands strung with lights, the glowing heart of our ruby red orchard. Festivities have wound down. My cousins sprawl asleep on sofas and floor, their parents nodding off as Miracle on 34th Street drones quiet and ever magic. I'm sitting in the gloom of my room staring at her text on my phone. The door opens with a slow groan. Wedo, my dad whispers. You awake? Come on, son. I wipe a tear from my cheek before he switches on the light. It's almost midnight, Christmas Eve. Wait, dad, I say, filled with worry. What's up? Everything okay? Shh, trust me. Come outside to see a gift like none you've ever received. Pure joy scattered down from the sky. Though his tone is weird, I follow him down the hall, out the back door. The world has been dusted white. Christmas snow. Impossible. A hundred years since it's happened, Dad says, taking crunching steps, face glowing with awed delight. A soft kiss. Snowflakes drift down like icy stars that speck the black. Fragments of magic, divine dust, blessings shaken out upon my head by God himself. I pull out my cell. She answers, voice creaky with sleep. Look outside, Joanna, I tell her. She gasps. Está nevando, güero. Merry Christmas, Bay. I miss you. Me too. So much. Te hablo mañana. I look at my dad. He nods at the weight of her absence. We stand together, silent for a moment, the house holy in its robe of snow, the trees pale sentinels beneath the clouds. Then we tumble back onto the dazzling blanket pulled loose over crabgrass, and for a moment we are angels, laughing and innocent as we spread our silver wings upon the earth. I don't suspect you're going to be out doing snow angels tomorrow on your way to the to the polling places. Well, I might, you know, I mean, it's always it's never too too cold for a snow angel. Let me tell you. And, uh, and, the kids and, love and, <laughs> yeah, they, they do. Um, and it was a delight for me. Um, and, and that that poem like slides immediately into the next one, which is a, a lot shorter. My journal. After we wake everyone up, after the midnight snowball battle, after the little snow people have turned the huercos bare palms bright red, mom makes a pot of chocolate. With my steaming mug trailing the scent of cinnamon and almonds, I head back to my room, shut the door, take a seat at my desk, pull out my journal, Six months worth of poetry. Sipping, I flip through the pages. Sometimes my eyes water. Other times laughter makes me almost spit chocolate all over those precious poems. So much has happened. So much. And I can see the shape of it now. The brief but sweet joys of summer pivoting into the bitter struggles of fall. The ghost of a special story like a diamond in the rough. An angel trapped in marble. But what am I? I am a poet, my pen a chisel of form, able to shape thoughts and events with meter and rhyme till they fit together, seamless and whole. I down the rest of the chocolate in a single gump, then, hands trembling, I start chipping away. Because part of the the conceit of this is is, he's a boy in middle school who's fallen in love with poetry, and he's writing poems like in his journal or whatever, and then the books themselves are him at some point a few months after the events going back and going oh here let me rearrange these things right fill in the gaps here with new poems and and turning out manuscripts that penguin random house is a publisher so well maybe not that part <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm very curious about your journey as a writer because it's mm-hmm. i mean the the variation that you've gone through um, for what you're writing is is really really fascinating because you you went from um that ghost of the rio grande book um, and that's that's com- so far removed from what like um, what's going on and they call her Fergona in like in many different ways. Yeah. Um, and, and so so what was it that, that drew you to be a writer and, and why did you pick to write this novel in verse rather than not verse? And, and there's so many questions like that that I have for you. 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I come from a like a, a family of storytellers here on the border. I'm from deep south Texas, from the Rio Grande Valley. And my fa- my family, my dad's side, the Mexican-American side, has lived here for like 200 years. And um, the, the, it's, the, the oral storytelling is like so important in our family. And I grew up with like the matriarch of the family, my my grandmother, Garza, um, who was, you know, the, the the greatest storyteller that I've ever heard who had this way of blending um, Mexican folklore with like the Gothic sensibilities of the South and, and crafting like a voice that was wholly her own that made me realize that, you know, these stories, because I would hear different ver- versions of them from my uncles and aunts and dad and so forth. But when she told them they were hers um, and she was completely in command of the story. And that was just just an amazing experience. And I knew that that's what I wanted. I, at the age of four, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be a storyteller. And I was, because I wanted it, I was always annoying her um, and would ask her to tell me more stories until she said, look, I'm, I'm out of stories. If you want more stories, you need to learn to read and go find books that will have more stories. And that's kind of like what moved me into literacy. I bugged my mom to teach me to read. And, you know, I dropped out of kindergarten because 1975 when I went to kindergarten they were just teaching the alphabet and I already knew how to read so I spent that year just going to the library every day and um and just devouring books until it became kind of like a part of me and you know fast forward many many years later uh, I've I, I know that I want to be a writer I also know that being a writer is not the kind of thing that you can support a family with so I go to college first so my family do so and become an English major and become a teacher um, and as I'm working with students who are just not able um, for a variety of reasons to really connect with the literature that's in the state adopted textbooks, uh, I have this epiphany that what drew me into literacy were the stories that my grandmother told me. And I started retelling them. But, you know, now as a storyteller, using the the tools of like literary fiction um, uh, creating short story versions of those and then teaching my students to do the same thing and empowering them to be like almost ethnographers who filter those stories of our shared heritage through that particular, the particularity of their voices and their experiences. And, Mm -hmm. and because that's what I want to do, because I want to center the border, the Mexican American community, our roots in Mexico, the roots of Mexico and pre-invasion Mesoamerica, you'll notice this like wide range of genres and age levels I'm working with but you'll also notice thematic similarities across all of those. And like what I'm trying to do in that work, um, you know, kind of like basically kicking open the gates that have been kept so vigilantly and holding them open and as many places as possible with as many of, of my hands and feet as I can. So that other people have a chance to, to play in that sandbox and, and have their voices heard. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've like, tried to cover a lot of those questions with, with that response, but feel free to. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. So, so where do you, you know, what do you say that you were like specifically looking like you said, oh, there's not a book like this. So I'm going to write a book like this to fill in that gap. Is that something you were consciously doing? I, I do that consciously with a lot of my work. This book in particular, or like this series, I suppose, now it's become kind of a series. It probably will be a trilogy. Um, arose a lot more organically than that. I, I am a very, very... Um, uh, specific and I plan and I, I'm a planner when I write, I outline, mm-hmm. I figure out a lot of details well in advance um, before I like go. And I, cause I think of writing as acting, like getting on a stage and performing. I, I have a script and I'm ad living a lot of times, but I know where I'm going and it's all about performance. And that's the pleasure that I get out of it. Um, but for, for they call me Buero, the, the first book in the series, it actually began with uh, an anthology. Uh, there, there's a great poet, Janet Wong, who works with um, Sylvia Bardell, a scholar of children's literature, and they put out a lot of like little poetry anthologies for kids, um, really successful ones, very, very popular with teachers. And right after the election in 2016, there uh, they were at NCTE, the Conference of the National Council of Ch- Teachers of English where I'll be in, in like about 10 days. Um, and a lot of teachers came up to them and said, we need a tool to help students who are grappling with the anxiety they feel, you know, vis-a-vis the social political situation that we are now in the midst of. Um, so we, we want a, a, a book of an anthology of poetry that will help them see themselves and help them grapple with these issues. And so they um, asked me to contribute a poem to that. Those Border Kid, the very first poem, um, in They Call Me Bueno, this book right here, for those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about. 
Um, and that book was reprinted in the Journal of Children's Literature. And when I got inducted into the, the Texas Institute of Letters in um, April of 2017, it was one of the pieces that I read. You have to get up in front of all these luminaries of Texas letters and read for 10 minutes, no pressure. Um, and it was the last poem I read, it was Boer Kid. And as I came down, a, a publisher, um, Bobby Bird, publisher of Cinco Puntos, who he uh, recently uh, passed away, great man, came up to me, hugged me and said, if you can write 50 more poems in that kid's voice, I will I will give you, I offer you a contract right now um, because we need that book. This is the right time for that book. And, and that's how the, the book began, but it was just going to be a collection, Tim. It wasn't going to be, I didn't imagine it as a novel in verse until I'd written a bunch of pieces and kind of organized them around holidays and food and, and music. And, and then I had uh, like a section that was about this kid's uh, seventh grade year that, my editor told me, Hey, you know, I, you're not going to want to hear this, but this wants to be a narrative. This mm -hmm. is striving to be something else. And so I rearranged everything. I put the poems inside of the seventh grade narrative and then started filling in the gaps. And so this is kind of where this conceit comes from of Wedo doing the same thing. Like he's been writing random poems in his journal and suddenly he's like, ah, oh, I see the shape of it now. I get what, what there's a story here that I need to carve a way to get at and add to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'd love to talk more about that, but let's uh, let's read a couple more poems from uh, from the book so people get more of a sense of what's going on here. Sure, absolutely. So um, one of the the great things about the first book um, was the relationship between um, Wero Casas, the, the the main character, and this who's a soft, sweet boy, and Joanna um, Padilla, who's a tough girl. And by the end of the book, he's asked her to be his girlfriend, and she's said yes. Because she, because he asked her for help when he was being beaten up by a bully, and she has a lot of respect for that. So this, a lot of this book, especially the first half of it, is about their relationship. So this is the kiss from page sixteen. The next day, first Monday of May, Joanne and I take a shortcut after school through the orange grove near my house. You know, she says, letting go of my hand to wipe a sweaty palm on her black jeans. There's just a month till school's out. It'll be harder to hang out since my parents expect me to, to help them all summer. I stop. She turns to look at me. There's something in her eyes that I can feel with my chest, which aches in a way I've never felt. Scary, but good. Everything fades. The sound of passing cars, the harsh drone of cicadas, all drowned out by the beating of my heart. The glossy green trees and bright dimpled fruit, hazy, out of focus, until all I can see are her lips, a red I can't even describe, dark, almost brown, the color of mesquite pods. Taking a shuddering breath that feels like it might be my very last, I ask my fregona, can I kiss you? She nods, slowly closing those big brown eyes. Si, güero, you can. So I do. And then the next poem is Her Song in My Blood, right on page 18. My heart thunders like a drum when our lips meet. Above that rhythm, I can hear a new melody. Notes from her soul slip into the measures of my heart. When we pull apart, all I want is to share that music, to stand on a stage before the world and make them listen to the vibrant, beautiful, living pulse of her song in my blood. Um, and, you know, I wanted um, to talk about first love. Middle grade novels usually don't have a lot of romance in them. That's supposed to be for teenagers only, not for middle schoolers or upper elementary. But that's nonsense because in real life, you do, you do fall in love. You have crushes and you have your first kiss usually when you're somewhere between sixth and eighth grade. If you're lucky, I suppose there are people who don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to depict that. And, and, and also just how like romance at that age is also about not just finding your, your way around your romantic partner, but also your way into their family, especially in the Mexican American community, you date a girl, you date her entire family. Yeah. Um, and so uh, a lot of, of this, of this first half of the book about their relationship is also about his getting to know her father and finding common ground because her father's a mechanic and he's like this, like this nerdy kid who likes to read a lot, but they have music in common. 
um, Weto is a musician and loves like older music um, that, that that her father is into. And um, I, I wanted to explore that element of romance, which you don't see very often. It's usually just about the couple. And I wanted to talk about the families coming together and finding ways to to meet when they realize that the young people from from their um, from their membership are, are falling for each other. It's it's an interesting um, social ritual that I, I don't think gets talked about very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely fascinating. And um, it's just a, a wonderful story throughout the book. And, and one of the things I want to talk about was the voice of the poet. Because mm-hmm. one of the things I find really interesting, I think we only had one poet on uh, the podcast before who's done young adult fiction, which is Ron Kirchie. Oh, okay. And he talked about... Um, how I think they want you to, I think it's two years ahead. Like you want the, the writing, the level of the writing and the, and the sort of the voice and the characters to be two years ahead of, of the people that, that your target audience is. Cause they kind of look up to the next, the next grades up, you know? And, yeah. and what was fascinating about this book is that you um, didn't like dumb down the poetry at all. The poetry is beautiful, good storytelling poetry with a, there's no like limit. It feels like on vocabulary, like you let your main character, Awaro um, speak very eloquently the whole time without seeming to restrict it, and yet it still feels like within the 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 mindset of seventh grade. So, so I was yeah. really fascinated. How did you come up with that? How did you know wh- where to set the tone and how far you could push it while feeling realistically seventh grade? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of things happened. In the first place, I definitely want to shout out. My, both of my editors, I've already mentioned Bobby Bird and uh, Joanna Cardenas is my editor at Coquilat, Penguin Random Mouse. Both of them were able <laughs> to put the brakes on my maybe more didactic uh, impulses. Um, I remember uh, early on in the Call Me Widow, Bobby telling me, okay, look, I want you to go through and he like named some poems and I want you to cut the last two lines of every single one of those poems. Just cut it and like read it without those two. And you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. You moralize, stop doing that. You're writing in the voice of a seventh grader. Um, and, but, and so that helped. They, they both were able to like curb some of my instincts at the same time in, they call me Wero. I established that Wero Casas is an exceptional boy. And he's a very bright kid who learned to read very young. He's got a very large vocabulary, he spends a lot of time reading. Um, and he has like a really sensitive nature. Um, he, he's, he, you know, he's, he thinks a lot about social justice. He thinks a lot about his community and where they stand as concerns the larger nation, stuff like that. Um, and so I, I spend time with him and his friends, like establishing that these are, you, you know, maybe not your normal kids. And so when he's, you know, anybody who falls in love with poetry when he's 12 years old and starts writing, you know, playing around with form and so forth, he's not, I mean, he's going to be doing things that other kids don't do. But at the same time, as you said, he's still a seventh grader in, in or part of this book. He's an eighth grader. He's going to get in trouble. He, he does mischievous things. He's kind of immature at, at moments when he needs to, you know, where an adult with his vocabulary and his, his breadth of knowledge would be um, able to, to center themselves better. I was really helped in all this by the fact that Wero is, is, is like about 30, 30% me and 30% my son um, uh, who is a lot like me. And um I was actually able because I fell in love with poetry when I was in was junior high at the time, not middle school. But uh, and I was I actually have all my poetry from back oh, then. Oh wow! So I literally went back and read. Um, these are things that I don't want other people to read, but that I was able to read to kind of get a to remember what it was like to be playing around with form and sometimes you know being overly pretentious and and using words that you don't quite know how to use, but just trying to find ways to slip them in. Um, and so the kind of like steal the best of myself from the past and pull it into the present. Um, and and be, because of that, because I was writing from a place of lived experience, there is that what you notice this kind of authenticity about it because it, it could come off like really, really uh, faked and forced uh, and, 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 you know, and, and like precocious or whatever. But because I tried to ground it in that and in the, my son, who was a teenager at the time, his own way, the way he talked to me, the way he talked to his sisters, the, the, the kinds of things he was interested in. Um, I think that I was able to to make it feel, to, to give it verisimilitude that it wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's very interesting to hear you say that that, that was the process. Because one of the things I learned uh, doing the Rattle Young Poets Anthology, which are kids uh, up to age 15, um, is that they there's there's so much more just complexity to the thoughts of of young people than you think. Like you look back when you were a kid, and unless you're actually reading your writing, you don't realize how much 
the the depth and the and the range of emotions and the and the the complex intellectual ideas you're grappling with at, at those ages. It's not like, and so that the tendency it feels like, especially. Um, I remember a Janet Fitch said that you should treat young kids like animals because that's all they have like in, in your novels. And, and that always stuck with me. But, um, but on the flip side of that is that, um, you know, there's just so much more interior is going on than we give credit for it. And that, that's one of the things that you really put forth well in this book. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely was one of my, my intentions. I, um, <laughs> when you are writing from the perspective of a young person, you can't, think of young people's animals because they don't think of themselves as animals. That's, that's definitely an outsider's perspective looking down at or back at, or for at least into that group rather than at, from within it, um, from within it, you feel like you're the human ones and the adults are the monsters sometimes. And so, yeah, yeah. that's a great, if way you to flip it. it, flip that away around that around, then um, it's definitely you know, an interesting change of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. It's, it's so true that you think of the adults as like the, the, the not humans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're the ones that you're like, why is this not blindingly obvious to you that this thing that you want to do is evil and bad and it's going to hurt people. But, yeah. 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 Totally true. That's funny. Um, okay. Let's read uh, another poem or two. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, here are a couple of poems that are about mothers and sons. Um, Wedo is really close to this mother, and so is one, one of his friends, um, Bobby Handy. Um, so here's two Mother's Day. It's a rondelle. Oh, on what page? My mom, it's, I'm sorry, yes, on page 45. Okay, thank you. My mom deserves two Mother's Days, twice the gifts, double the rest, el mes de mayo día 10, and that second Sunday in May. Mexicana in the USA works hard to make our home the best. My mom deserves two Mother's Days, twice the gifts, double the rest. With dad, we sweep and scrub away and cook our favorite foods with zest to show we know that we are blessed. We decorate with bright bouquets. My mom deserves two mother, Mother's Days. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of the the, the there, there are like three different strands there's there's the there's the love thing there's the family thing there's the friendship thing and there's a community thing so the friendship strand is the the bobbies this group of three kids that Wero hangs out with who are all named robert or roberto um they start a band because they want to compete in the the talent show and they see how poorly everyone else does and they know they can do better but the problem is they don't have a drummer and and bobby handy who is the only person who doesn't play another instrument they think he can be the drummer but he has no rhythm and uh Wedo takes it upon himself to to fix the situation so this is the poem finding handy's rhythm and, and page- bobby handy has no rhythm i'm sorry it's on page 84 i'm okay. sorry tim i keep doing that bobby handy has no rhythm cannot clap to save his life watch him dance it's quite a sight out of sync and way too slow we need a drummer though so I'm the lucky devil who gets to teach this awkward boy just how to feel the beat. I start with basic music, like 50s rock and roll. It has a solid downbeat that anyone should feel. Not handy, no, his claps keep slipping in between the notes. So I try to inspire him to hear other rhythms and household appliances as he sits on the top of the dryer or leans his ear against the dishwasher. Of course, that doesn't work. So we switch to the outside and listen to nature, droning cicadas and hastening river, flapping of wings and dripping of dew. In despair, I remember the primary pumping that each of us hear when we first come alive. Then I head to the handies, prepared for rejection, but determined to try every last possibility. Mrs. Handy, I begin. You love your son. He loves you. But he's forgotten something. How your heartbeat sounds. It's push and pull. Help him hear it, ma'am. He needs that rhythm. For one week straight, they spend each evening watching TV on the couch. She asks him to hold her hand, lay his head on her chest, tapping out the pulse that brought him to the world. Then one day he comes to practice, sits down at the drums and lifts the sticks. A miracle. He starts to strike a tom in perfect time, a thud like blood that thunders in our veins. So you could see me playing around with different types of 
uh, rhythms going from iambic to trochaic to um, dactylic and just like as like Weto trying to find a rhythm that his friend can fit um, and that was a lot of fun and um, making music an, an essential part of it I, I grew up um, playing lots of different instruments and um, my dad was a musician my mom was too and my dad at one point wanted to start a Tejano band with with his sons and so I, I've like kind of mined from that to to create this this situation um, and that that musicality becomes really important because even though I haven't chosen any poems to read about the plot, because I kind of want to spoil it for people, mm-hmm. um, the, there's a, a pivot point midway through the book when Joanna's father uh, on the first day of eighth grade, after he drops her off, is, is picked up by ICE in a, a raid right outside of the school. Um, there's a, a, an outstanding warrant for his arrest because of a ticket that he never paid that he didn't know existed um, and deportation hearings begin. And the stro- the, the book, changes from this like lovely story of friendship and first love and families coming together to the community like being like kind of split apart at the seams because even among Mexican Americans there are many of us who uh, would see the letter of the law um, enforced and people who no matter how long they've been here and no longer no matter how much they've contributed um, if they're here without the proper documentation, they should be sent back to where they come from. That's their attitude. So that becomes the, the you know, the the meat of the matter and, and how it, you know, destroys Joanna, how it like, like really complicates their romance. Because one of the things that Weta wants to do is to fix her problem. And you're a 13 year old boy, you can't fix a problem like that. And um, it gets, it gets a little messy. He does all kinds of stuff to try to get his community to come together, puts on a you know, there's a benefit concert, there's all these things, protests and websites and social media, and none of it works. Um, uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, that's part of the lesson he has to learn in this book is is how to just be there for someone and instead of trying to solve their problems. Yeah, that brings up one of the other things I, I was really curious about um, reading this book was that at first, I, I'm wondering about who your, who your target audience is, because at first, the, the first half of the book maybe feels like, um, you know, written for, for people who, who live in that border region, both figuratively and literally, uh, you know, feeling represented and, and having their lives shown in literature. And then, yeah. and then it sort of has that shift, and you realize that it's written for, to me, it feels like it's written for a broader audience, given the, the, cult, the political dynamics going on over the last, you know, six years or whatever, with the, the wall being the main political topic and, and, and that issue. Um, so, so who was it that you were writing for? And, and it also plays into the amount of Spanish you use, which is a really, there's a sort of a nice level where it's, it's a little more than just throwing some words here and there, but it's enough where um, only, you know, I, I took Spanish in like middle school, but other than that, I don't know any Spanish, but I could read along perfectly well but it was like a challenge a little bit too where you had to learn some words and context as you go so, yeah. so what was your idea of of who this book was written for because it feels like it was written for everyone almost which is a really interesting aspect of it yeah i mean and that's one of the things that i want to do um you know I, I, I in some remarks that i made um at the texas book festival talking about um the way people view um, literature that's written by Mexican American authors or Latinx authors in general or black authors, Asian American authors. Um, there's this idea that th- that that literature is for those people. But in reality, you know, that's that's as foolish as saying, you know, that the Odyssey, it's only for Greeks from 2,500 years ago, or, you know, Faulkner, that's only for white senators of the early 20th century. Um, the specificity is what makes it universal. And so like, the first half of it is definitely, I mean, I'm definitely writing with the members of the Mexican American community, young people from our community in mind, like they are the first people, if I'm a storyteller, sitting in front of the, the of a fire. Um, they're the ones that are first in that circle of light in front of me. Um, but I'm writing for all the kids that are that are there as well, that that need to hear about Mexican American kids and need to to know about our culture. It's not something that just we need to celebrate. Like all of us need to know about the plurality of identities that exist in this country um, and how wonderful life is in, in our community. So there's a lot of that. There's like, here, take a look at the border community. It's not some kind of post-apocalyptic landscape where Mad Max is racing through <laughs> fighting mutants. No, it is a very normal human place where people just speak more Spanish and eat spicy food, okay? Uh, <laughs> um, and But that pivot is also so now you know who we are now look at what's being done to us look at what the the politics in this country and the lack of humanity 
um, in in the, a lot of what's going on on the far right is you know causing in these border communities the fractures that it's um, engendering. Um, and those are lessons that everybody needs to hear about. So yes, I definitely am writing for everybody. Um, I want to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. I want to represent, you know, Mexican Americans. And I also want other people to go, damn, Mexican American culture is really cool. And this is a great book. And I want, you know, kids from um, all communities to be reading this. Um, and not just because like, I'll make more money in royalties that way, but it, because it'll be, you know, I think it's a healthy thing. We all need to be reading each other's stories and so celebrating one another and trying to understand one another if we're going to live alongside each other in a truly pluralistic society, which I would hope is what you know, this country ought to be, although clearly there are people who don't think so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And definitely the the whole the media perspective that you get, I mean, it feels just if you only watch the news that that area is like controlled by drug cartels and it's just this lawless, like you said, Mad Max wasteland. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so, so countering that, I mean, how frustrating is that to hear those stories and have that narrative presented? It is extremely frustrating. Um, and for young people, it's actually, it's, it's, you know, deleterious. It's, it's destructive. It does something to their sense of self-worth to always hear themselves being put down. Um, and so there've been a, like a multiplicity of books that have come out in the last um, you know, six years or so by Mexican American authors um, kind of pushing back against that uh, narrative um, and, and trying to say, and tr trying to point out that it's manufactured. It's manufactured, you, you pretend that, that people coming into the US from browner countries is somehow a dangerous thing because in those countries there is crime. There's freaking crime in the US, <laughs> you know? sure. there's crime everywhere. It's, it's, trust me, it's a lot more dangerous to live in like big cities in red states than it is to live on the border mm -hmm. the, t the town where i live in donna there's 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 no homicide rate here there's no murder there they there um there's hardly any of that kind of stuff in the valley at all there's there there are sure there are some drug thing drug issues drugs come through here um but drugs come through here to go elsewhere mm -hmm. um and we just happen to be part of the corridor um, that doesn't make us complicit in any way. And it's like foolish to imagine that families that are trying to escape violence in El Salvador and Guatemala and, and Cuba and other places, um, people for whom we have lots of space should be excluded from the possibility, um, from their very human right, I would argue, to migrate away from danger into safety, to seek asylum as international law allows them to do. Uh, it, it's just, it's a really, really a, a gross way of looking at it. And when you live in an area that is being looked at that way, it does, it makes you, you know, if you're a young person, you doubt your self-worth. And so, you know, one of the things I wanna do here is to, to reassure young people in our community, no, that's all BS, that's all manufactured. And also tell people outside, hey, knock this shit off, you know, stop making our children suffer psychologically because you wanna have a rallying cry for your like really twisted politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really well said. Um, uh, if anybody has any questions for David uh, Bowles, please uh, leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube. I'm monitoring both of those, and I'll pass any along that you might have. Um, if you're on Twitter, you got to find Facebook or YouTube because I don't pay attention to Twitter. But um, uh, in the meantime, David, do you want to read another couple poems? Yeah, let me just like like read maybe two more from um, uh, Fregona before we kind of maybe. Um, yeah, we should move on to the other book. Pivot, pivot, pivot to pivot to some adult stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, although I think that there's lots to love for adults in this as well. So. Um, they they take a break um, and he writes Joanna a bunch of poems and eventually um, they make up. And so this is a poem making up. Page? She finds me in the, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> I keep sorry. doing this. I it's on page. I should have looked him up. No, it's, no, it's no. It's on page. My it, fault. We, but we totally agreed before we went on the air <laughs> that we were going to do this. And I get caught up in the moment. It's 167. Okay. She finds me in the library, a half dozen poems in her hand, like a bouquet plucked from the garden of my soul. Yes, she whispers. The word is a key, turning in the lock, hanging from the hasp of the solid door that has kept us apart. She flings it wide open with a kiss. Um, and yeah, again, I, there's a there's stuff that I thought about reading, but I really, I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping that listeners will like go, go out and find this book and check it out from your library, buy it, whatever, yeah, share they, it with you. They definitely will. Yeah. Um, but I will read uh, one poem because there is, we discover that uh, this deportation of her father um, it is <laughs> revenge for something that happened in the first book. It's really ironic. Like um, her protecting Weta from bully, the bully 
um, is the son of somebody who has a grudge and has uh, a grudge against widow's uh, father and then has like a, a way to, to manipulate the situation. So um, th- she has a final confrontation with this bully. Um, she's trying to get him expelled by getting him to beat her up. Mm-hmm. And widow finds out about it. And at the last minute shows up right before it's about to happen. And the, the poem is called take the blows. I tried everything only to learn that I can do nothing for her, but she has been beaten enough. At the very least, I can take these blows for her. And then the next poem is Into the Gap. She's not expecting me to show up, much less thrust my scrawny body into the gap between Snake and her. My arms reach back, grab hers, push her away as gently as I can before Snake's fist smashes into my face. I crumple and he falls on me. After the third blow, I no longer feel anything. Dawning skies go black. It doesn't go well for the bully, so just don't don't worry about it. Widow's fine. <laughs> Widow survives. And then, like the, the, the really really short little thing to to wrap it up, a trova called "Holding Hands in Dad's Old Truck" on page two ten. Twice a day, forget the world. Fifteen minutes of pure luck. All things fade except my girl, holding hands in Dad's old truck. So yes. You know, things do, there's a kind of a bittersweet uh, end. Uh, things are still complicated. Dad doesn't come back to the, the U.S., spoiler alert. Um, but a lot of the story is just about, like, grappling with the reality of, you're, you're a teenager. You're a 13-year-old. You, how are you going to change, you know, U.S. policy about stuff? It's it's, it's really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's it's when you write for kids, sometimes you you have to, you can't just give them happy endings all the time. Sometimes you have to. You have to be honest with them. You have to be real. And they appreciate that, I think, more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just so much more mature than I think adults give them credit for. I mean, every time we do a Young Poets anthology, that's just very stark. Even, like, the eight-year-olds on there think a lot more deeply than than we assume they do, which is a really fascinating thing about kids. Um, so how has been the, the reaction to this book? I mean, it's, it's, it's just shocking to me that it's, it's in, in pro or in verse and, um, and still so well received. It's been, I think it's in its third printing. It's won like 10 awards or something that the original, um, the new yeah. one just came out, but, um, um, how, how has it been like received as poetry as a novel in verse versus, um, regular, regular prose? Is there a lot more freedom in young adult literature? Or, I mean, why is that something that you don't see in adult? poetry or adult books yeah too. yeah no isn't it strange right it no really i mean is. novels and novels and verse um it's kind of slowly crept into the middle grade and ya market you know about mm, 2015 years ago there was a series of like really really thick ones uh pulse and burn a couple other titles um but really it's been this last decade where we've seen them take off um with writers like jason reynolds um, and Elizabeth Acevedo, people who are coming from from rap and spoken word poetry, coming into writing for children and and using those types of sensibilities to, to craft work. And novels and verse, you'd be really, really surprised, appeal a lot to young people who are normally kind of, you know, dubious about poetry. But when it's written, I mean, they like white space on the page. Mm-hmm. Reluctant readers love to see something short, like you know, like Holly Widow's like this itty bitty book um, with lots of, you know, white space on the page. So they're not overwhelmed by text. Um, and usually, you know, um, like Widow's uh, teacher from seventh grade tells him poetry is the clearest lens for viewing the world. And when they get that, when they see that this is this little tight little piece of text is going to like really reveal something, really get at the heart of something, um, they, they fall in love with it. Uh, and then it's something they can turn around and do. They can use these poems as models. And so a lot of teachers really love it. And there's been a lot of changes in state and national level testing and poetry is on these tests now. And so teachers have always been looking for ways to to make poetry accessible to kids. And um, so there's a surprisingly large demand um, in, um, in just, man, just in like the past five years, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of novels and verse have been published. Um, and I mean, I wish this were happening for adults, but I suspect, and I mean, you work with it a lot more than I do, and I may have kind of a cynical view of it, but I really think that academia and um, 
the ivory tower attitude or even just counterculture attitude of a lot of poets has made poetry inaccessible to common folk. It's become something that needs to be dense and difficult and, um, you know, super opaque with lots of references to stuff that only people in this little clique are going to get. And if you don't get it, well, it's because you're a dumbass, you know, and, and I, and, and I want, I want poetry like to be what it is, which is, you know, a way for people to express you know, the most important and deepest things that people think about. Um, and it should be expressed in language that is accessible to people. And obviously, Wedo is a kid who uses a lot of big words, but his poetry is really accessible. And I've had like tons of adults read it and go, I wish there were books mm -hmm. that were written for adults that were written in this way. Um, and maybe it'll happen, you know, maybe as teens who fall in love with novels and verse become adults, they'll be looking around for this. And narrative poetry um, for adults will have a renaissance. That would be really fantastic. Mm -hmm. I know that in my own poetry for adults, I try to be more narrative. And, and even if I am being opaque and whatever, I try to make it, you know, feel like it's about something and that there's movement and, and that it has significance for just everyday, you know, men and women and, and non-binary people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's exactly what I mean, I completely agree being inside nothing but poetry. That's what Rattle was founded to do is to try to push mm -hmm. against that vein of being so academic and esoteric that regular people can't enjoy it. Um, uh, there's, there's a question. Maybe this can be a bridge to, to your book, too. Um, so Danny Mask wants to know who was just on earlier. Um, he wanted to know about continuity in the book. So the book moves like a novel, which which everybody re watching should know. I mean, it, it goes almost scene to scene. It's like his journal on those big journals and poetry. And so you get the whole right. seventh and eighth grade years. Um, but but your uh, your forthcoming book, which we're going to read poems from now, is not written in that style. So how much was continuity um, between poems? Um, how much was that a thought in your in your upcoming book? That's that's adult um, poems, um, liminal. Oh yeah, no, I try. I I, I avoided it altogether. I yeah. didn't. I didn't. I didn't bother. I didn't care about continuity. I wasn't trying to do anything like that. Um, the the poems in this upcoming collection, liminal, um, are they're drawn from my own life. They're about things that matter to me, or they're about people in the past in, in spaces that I inhabit now. Um, it, it's all about thinking about the border and thinking about having an identity that, that spans that border, like a transnational identity um, and just all the implications of that. Um, and they're poems that I've written over the course of a decade. So I, there was no rhyme or reason. I was just writing poems as I came to me and sending them out to get published places um, and, and putting it, putting them together i you know i just kind of i didn't think about those kinds of things at all because it's it's irrelevant to this but when i was writing fregona i mean obviously you know it needed to be stitched together but i also believed in both Huero and fregona that it was important that those poems stand alone so that i could read those poems and most most of the ones that i read function relatively well as standalone poems you know you know extricated from the narrative there are a couple that don't that are a little bit more like um, suturing things together because um, it is I don't know it is a bit like a Frankenstein monster mm -hmm. um, um, and hopefully the the sutures are kind of invisible to the time occasionally it, there, it, there's a little bit of a clunky and it, none of that is due to my editor she worked really hard to get me to stop doing clunky transitions from <laughs> one thing to the next yeah that was actually uh, but yeah. one thing I wanted to ask about it was just yeah. how how you managed to do that because it, it does feel like each even though it's obviously a narrative sequence. Each poem feels like it's its own poem. And, you know, a yeah. poem has its own problem that it's solving. And, and, you know, so it's very easy to have a poem that's just getting you from one place to another. Like, you know, you have to have transitions in a novel um, yeah. from one, one you know, thing to next. And somehow you manage to have the poems stand individually um, as their own. Yeah, sometimes it took a lot of work. Um, and then sometimes it was like, you know, I... I just have to trust the reader to be able to, fill, I'm, I'm going to jump here and let their minds fill in that gap. And I, I think that's, you know, it's true of novel writing as well. Like there's a, there's a point at which you, you don't spell everything out. They, they, you know, they don't need to see every bathroom break or, you know, you can, they're, if you're compelling in the way you're writing it and the, in the moment that you're moving from and to, um, work well together then that they can bridge that gap in their mind and i also do graphic novels and the same thing is true of the gutters between panels right you know as you're moving from panel to panel you're trusting the reader to be able to um use their own mind and um when you you know when you trust and i think a lot of 
not, maybe not a lot. There are some writers who don't trust readers or who don't want readers to have that kind of autonomy and don't want it to be a partnership between the writer and reader, but it is. And ultimately, um, if you write with them in mind and um, with a specific type of reader in mind, especially, um, you can you can take shortcuts that will work just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hear a poem uh, from the upcoming book to get a sense of that. Okay. Yeah. So the very first poem um, from Liminal is called Por la Libre. Just out of Reynosa, you shifted into fifth and roared to the state line, cigarette in hand. At the checkpoint, we just waved our IDs, my license, your green card, no need for permits or passports then. You pulled into a deposito, bought a six pack of Tecate light, and then we hit the freeway. Clutching a can between your knees, you worked the gear shift like a racer, blazing along a thin ribbon of gray down that arid, brush speckled plain. Alejandro Guzman crooning hoarse against guitars as I leaned back in the bucket seat watching you, the wind snatching at your dark curls, rattling your earrings. I surrendered myself to the speed, to the road, utterly in your hands as you blew through Bravo, the towns of China and Los Ramones a distant blur, the petroleum fields of Calareta belching fire, 200 kilometers in about two hours. At Guadalupe, you looped to skirt Monterrey till the Sierra Madre rushed rocky toward us, the massive M of Chipinque verdant with pine. You downshifted, took us up that sinuous road, parked away from other cars. Then, hand in hand, intoxicated by the drive, the music, the beer, we slipped into those clinkant shadows beneath the gnarled and silent boughs and made love upon the leaves and needles, like a Wastek couple three millennia past, newly arrived in these holy heights, having traveled from Maya lands to be joined together before the gods at the very tip of the world. So you can kind of see some of the same sensibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Just like like a little more R rated, right? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this, like this thing that I'm telling you about this continuity of Mexican American identity and, you know, it's, it's rootedness and Meso American identity and Mexican identity and so forth. And, um, and then like hopefully projecting out into the future to like whatever we call ourselves a thousand years from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so so I want to talk about. Um, I, I haven't had a guest on who ever had written books on ghosts, which is just really interesting to me. So, um, <laughs> so how did you go from? Because um, you have, I think, two books, right? You have Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley, and um, there's I another have border one. Lore, I have Border Lore, yeah, which yeah. is options for a TV series. I also have a couple other things. I've got uh, Mexican Beastry, which is a collection of. Uh, like it's like an illustrated encyclopedia of monsters from Mexican Mex American tradition, um, and and even a lot of the books that I write for young people, um, like my chapter book series from Harper Collins called Thirteenth Street, um, grapple with like monsters and ghosts and stuff like that that are drawn from our traditions, and mm -hmm. um, part of that is you know growing up with those storytellers that I, that I mentioned before. Um, a lot of the stories they would tell us boys, uh, myself and my, and my cousins, uh, were scary stories because that's what we wanted to hear. And also scary stories because they were meant to curb the um, more mischievous instincts of, <laughs> of boys, right? To keep us from swimming in the canals and doing other stupid things. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, because of how essential those kinds of stories and how essential like dark folklore is to my family, um, I set about trying to preserve those things and retell them in my own voice. Yeah, and and so so you've gone all over the place, um, sort of investigating areas with that are haunted things, which is a strange thing to do. Do you? I mean, it's an interesting transition. It, it's funny to me because the, the 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 model of this show kind of is because I used to work a lot of overnight shifts at a group home um, before mm. this job, and so I'd always listen to Art Bell to um, oh, you know pass the time because everybody would be asleep, so I'd be listening to his ghost stories and the callers and stuff like that. And um, so I've just always had a love of that, too. It's just fascinating, even though I'm not sure what I feel about anything being real, but it's fun to explore. Oh, yeah. So, so how do you – is there any – have you been anywhere where you felt actually, like, creeped out, like there would, might be actually haunted? Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm super agnostic about that stuff. I'm, I'm a major skeptic. And, and usually when I come at those things – and Ghosts of the Ring and Valley is a perfect example of it because when the history press asked me – to, to write a book for their Haunted America series. I was like, I want to do this, but I want to do it by embedding these ghost stories in a historical context mm -hmm. and talking about why the community continues to talk about 
the San Juan hotel being haunted or, or like this particular place where there used to be a, a hospital, like what's going on? What's the underlying reason that we tell ghost stories about these places? Cause it's usually communal trauma. Hmm. Um, and so I've been to places where I feel freaked out, <laughs> but I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't literally, I don't believe they're ghosts, but I believe that there are ghosts um, uh, in the sense of the, the, the phantoms that like kind of like, kind of curdle in our collective unconsciousness Mm -hmm. around you know horrible events that have happened and uh, maybe sometimes horrible events that don't make it into the history books like down here in the Rio Grande Valley in 1915 thousands of Mexican Americans were lynched by Texas Rangers and um and you know federalized national guardsmen stuff like that who were sent down about 100,000 troops because they were afraid of an uprising of Mexican Americans because there were some people in Mexico trying you know to come up with a plan to create an uprising in the Southwest. And so just out of this knee jerk fear without any kind of evidence that anything was happening, they sent down all these troops and thousands of people ended up being killed. Um, and, but that kind of stuff didn't make it into the history books. It was preserved just in oral traditions and in hauntings. Um, and a lot of those, the, the haunted places were places where people were lynched. And so it, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that I find really fascinating about it. Clearly, there's, like, there's the entertainment value of like sitting around and being spooked out by a creepy story. And that's fun. I love to creep kids out. It's great to see them all, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, but I also want to preserve the stories because the stories have a greater significance, a greater heft and weight and importance than that. Um, and so uh, both of those books, Border Lore and Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley, have these almost like scholarly kind of introductions that are like, hey, I know that you're thinking to yourself, what the hell is this dude telling a bunch of ghost stories? Do something a little more meaningful, David. Um, but it is meaningful work it, 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 because I'm exploring something that needs to be explored and explicitly understood and talked about because it's been it's been preserved in secret and whispers and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's really so, interesting, too, because I was trying to find for last week's episode a, a poet to do a Halloween show because it was like Halloween. We did it the day before. And it's hard yeah. to find like like horror and ghost story type poems. Even um, it's it's not a topic. It sort of feels too genre, maybe for the academic types that we were talking about before. Um, but uh, but yeah, but I find it all fascinating. I think there's some something more to reality than we think, and which is more like a projection of the collective unconscious than than anything else. But there's definitely something. The UFOs are the same type thing. Like we kind of see stuff that we imagine, and there's a way that they're real, even though they're not. And it's just fascinating to me. Yeah, you know, and I I have written some speculative poetry and poetry that explores that idea. And in fact, if you'd indulge me, I'll read one more poem from Liminal that literally is like exactly what we're talking about right now. Yeah, let's it's definitely first- do that. Yeah. Towards the very end, there's this poem called Outside the Earthborn Brain. Nature red in tooth and claw, hisses hot breath against our skin, glittering eyes in the dark and distant yet ominous howls, storms and drought and flood, shuddering earth and raging fire, life and danger even from enemies too small for us to see. And somehow, this bleakness cannot suffice, cannot explain the terror curling in our minds, the surety that monsters roam. So we scour forest and desert, trawl the rivers, dredge the lakes, scry the heavens with ear and eye, desperate for tracks, signs. Demons there must be, ghosts, aliens, incomprehensible gods something intolerable that we ourselves are the only monsters. Yeah. And that's something I think about a lot. Um, And, you know, I love horror. I love science fiction. I love writing all that stuff, but I also see it all as metaphor because I really, really think, and I mean, there's no way of knowing for sure, but I really, really think that the darkness that pervades the universe is being projected from within us. And that is some scary, that's scary right there. That that's more horrifying to me, to my mind, than there the exist the possible existence of aliens and monsters. Mm-hmm. The possibility that we are the only monsters in the universe, that's some I don't know, that that keeps me up at night. Yeah, that's the most terrifying thing to me too. Especially the uh the most scary thing to me, wherever I get creeped out, is the, the sense of a mirror. Because if you saw something behind you, it would be like you just projecting that you know and and, and the yeah, fact that it's well, you like, turn around and it's not there but it's yeah. in the mirror but like what it's, else could it's it be? in your yeah. head and that you're making it be there it's like far more scary than something actually there that you could like punch or something, you know? right you can't you can't shoot it you can't exactly. like fight with it um yeah, yeah. it's 
Um, oh, yeah, that kind of stuff is horrifying. It's like, mm, what's the, what's that that move? Fight Club? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, if you're punching something, you just be beating your own self up. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. Um, so you've done so many different genres and styles. Um, one last question, and then maybe one more mm-hmm. poem. But um. Yeah. Uh, what is like the most challenging thing that you've encountered of all the genre you've done? You've done graphic novels, you've done, um, you know, fiction, you've done, you know, these um, research intensive um, nonfiction books. Um, what, what do you find like the most enjoyable and what do you find the most challenging of, of all those genres that you do? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think what I find most enjoyable is writing kind of like, mm, like supernatural fiction that is kind of contemporary, but like rooted in, um, in mythology or sacred stories, or whatever. I, this that's a lot of fun. Uh, I've I co-written a couple of books with my friend Guadalupe Garcia McCall that are coming out from Bloomsbury, the people who published Harry Potter. Um, we've got one book coming out next year, Secret of the Moon Conch, and then the following year is um, Hearts of Fire and Snow. And they're both like contemporary, um, like YA supernatural things, um, but they are like rooted in like Aztec and Toltec ideas and myths and that's just a lot of i have so much fun writing that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and probably the second for me would be writing uh, novels in verse it's just something about when you're writing a novel you have to write a lot of shit man you have to like you're it's like we literally wrote a hundred and thirty thousand word novel we eventually cut thirty thousand words off of it but when you can write a novel in verse and you can tell a you can make a really good novel with like twelve thousand words Mm -hmm. like the, the concision and um and just compression that you get out of poetry is, is really a lot of fun. And I just love writing poetry. I, I love, you know, all of its tools. I love the voice. I've been writing poetry probably the longest of anything since I was mm-hmm. um, in my early teens. Um, the most rewarding is probably translating, translating somebody else's work, and rendering in English, um, especially something really old. Cause I've translated a lot of, I, I'm, a scholar of Nahuatl, uh, which is the indigenous language still spoken today by one and a half million people in Mexico and Central America, but it was the language of the Aztecs, right? And so I've translated a lot of poetry um, from that language and so forth. And that is really rewarding to take words written like 500 years ago in a very different culture and make that make everything, the, the sentiment, the musicality, all that accessible for the modern day. The hardest freaking thing to write are screenplays. Oh, yeah. I have tried, I've, I'm right now presently like, you know, working on a couple of pitches with, a friend of mine um, to a, a major Hollywood producer. And that's, that is, that kicks my ass every single time. Screenwriting is just like a totally different type of craft. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of akin to writing comic scripts, graphic novel scripts, which I've kind of figured out now and I'm really enjoying, but it, it's, it's really hard, but I love that kind of stuff, Tim. I love pushing myself to the limits. I love the, the challenge of saying, here is a genre I have never, ever written and I am going to learn how to do it. And I'm not going to learn how just how to learn how to do it middle in a middling way. I'm going to be a badass in this genre, and um, <laughs> you know maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't end up being that, but I try. I certainly try. Yeah, um, I know I said that was the last question. One more thing I'm wondering about, and I can't help because you might be the only poet we have on for a while who I could ask this to. Uh, but you mentioned earlier that you t- you teach to support yourself. But I assume, given how much you write now, that you don't have to anymore, and, and at some point right. stopped. Um, yeah. so, so what was that like to, to finally, you know, get to a point where writing itself supports yourself and was it difficult to make that leap where it's like, Oh, I'm not going to get a paycheck anymore. I'm just going to support yeah. myself from the royalties of the books I'm writing and will write in the future because I'm going to have creativity continue. Um, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll be r- real with you. So, um, one of the, the things about being a teacher, especially in the state of Texas, but there are te- teacher retirement systems in, in most states was that. I have a really, really intelligent wife. And she's like, look, I know you want to be a writer. This is 30 years, 31 years ago. I know you want to be a writer, but look, become a teacher first. You love, you love working with kids, become a teacher first. That, that tech, that teacher retirement system, you only have to work for about 30 years Mm -hmm. and then you get to retire and you'll be in your early fifties and you'll retire. And yes, I mean, it's not a huge paycheck, but you get your retirement check every month. And then if you're at that time, you happen to be writing, you know, the writing will be, you know, the dressing on top. Well, fast forward 31 years and the woman was right. I mean, she's, if she, I don't know if she's, she might be listening outside the door. She's always right about everything. Um, uh, I am actually going to retire in May. So I'm, I'm literally like 
about to take the steps that you're suggesting because yes, my writing, I, I now make twice as much. I mean, I hate to talk about this. So mm-hmm. please y'all don't, don't be disappointed in me talking about money, but I make about twice as much for my writing as I do for my salary. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it, it, a lot of it is I've been funneled into my children and helping them have homes, stuff like that. But I'm at a point now where I don't need to teach anymore. And the retirement, which will be, I don't know, like 60% of my monthly check now from the university will be sufficient with this other writing. And it is a great feeling, Tim, yeah, the, that, the, yeah. the, it, it is a little, it's a little scary mm-hmm. because you are letting go and you no longer belong to an institution or a corporation or whatever. And you're like a, you're a free agent. Um, but it's exhilarating. You're like, okay, wow. You know, I worked really hard from a place where everybody told me that there was no way I was going to be able to be successful doing what I was doing. There's no way that a light skin, even a light skin Mexican American with, you know, an, an Anglo Irish last name, not even you, if you choose to write about the Mexican American experience, you're not going to make it because nobody reads that shit. I don't know what you, do, I know what you're thinking. And to, you know, uh, you know, several decades later to have found the modicum of success. I don't have a best selling book yet, but I, my books sell well. Um, and they are award winning and, and, um, they, they bring in enough money for me to survive on. Um, it, it, it is a rewarding thing. And it, it's a thing that also makes me get excited about mentoring other writers and say, yes, you can do this too. And it may take some time um, and it takes some planning and it takes, you know, building in a support system so that as you're writing and building your reputation, you, you're not, you're not starving to death, but it is something accomplishable. But part of it is also being willing to do what needs to be done, being willing to write what needs to be written. Um, I've never been a prima donna about it. I've always been able to find a way to take what I'm interested in writing about and take what needs to be written and find a way for those two to, to intersect so that I'm content writing something that is viable for the marketplace and and worth the attention of my community, if that makes sense. It does. That's a great response. Um, you know, both great advice. I'm very grounded in reality, but also inspiring, too, that, that that's a possibility. So very cool. I'm glad, glad you got to share that. It's not a lot of poets I can talk to who could say that type of thing. Um, but let's close it out. Uh, we're, we've gone over time, so thanks for some extra time too. But it's been fun talking to you. Let's close out with yeah, one yeah. last poem. Okay. So at the very end of my collection, uh, Liminal, there is a, a section of poems that I wrote <laughs> during during the quote unquote lockdown, the initial stages of COVID. Um, called uh, they were poems that I wrote in Nahuatl and then wrote an English version of called In Weka Otli, which means the deep road. Um, and this is the the fourth piece uh, from that. Um, and you know, when I think about the possibilities of tomorrow's election and where we might go from here, you know, it does give me pause. I am worried about things, um, but the cyclical nature of the universe um, and the philosophical vision of some of my ancestors makes me find a little bit of hope. And so that's kind of what this is about. It's really short. In order to create, we must destroy, said the knight to his twin, the feathered wind. You sigh, you weep in vain. No, replied that precious plume, when the breeze blows soft and rain cools their skin, folks will know they are loved and feel hope. Mm -hmm. And so in that balance between chaos and order, destruction and creation, that is at that heart of Mesoamerican philosophy, I think we can find hope. We may be about to go into a, a cycle of darkness and destruction, but it always ends and is always followed by order and creation again and so i just i want everybody to to hold to hang in there and hold on and keep fighting the good fight and we'll we'll emerge on the other side into the light again excellent thank yeah, you great. so much tim yeah thanks hey before we leave though could you read that in the original uh I, i'm sure i haven't looked at the chat but i'm sure everyone's asking <laughs> oh sure okay uh, let me let me get a little closer here it's a little smaller inik titla chiwaske moneki titla poloske Kimili wili in yo waltzin in koautzin. Iwitika ehe katzin san nen wetsi in melsi chiwilis in mocho kilis. Atmo kito inon ketsali in ikwak ehe kaz iwan kiyawilos kimatis in tlakatl in tlasotlalo. Iwan Minete Machil Nies. It's a beautiful language. I love it so much. Yeah, that is. Thanks so much, David. That was wonderful. Uh, just a wonderful episode. Great guest. Great talking to you. Learned about all the wonderful things you're doing. I appreciate it. 
Thank you so much and continue the great work. I love Rattle. Love what you've done so far. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, it was David Bowles with um, his, uh, he's got Liminal, which is the forthcoming book coming out in the spring. And then um, um, Call Her Fergona is um, his newest book just out, um, the novel in verse, if you'd like to pick it up from, um, from Penguin Random House. Um, so do check that out. You can find more of uh, David Bowles' work at his website, which is David Bowles. That's David, B-O-W-L-E-S dot U-S. Um, so find all of his work there. So many things he does. Monsters and Mysteries in America, um, the ghost books, the uh, novels in verse. Um, just there's a lot of wonderful work in David's website and his, and his, uh, his uh, what would you call it, his bookcase that he's written. So, um, yeah, do check all of that out. Hope you buy a copy of something. Now, uh, we're going to go take a quick break and go to open lines. Before we do, let me tell you how it works. Uh, first, right now, email your poem only if you'd like to share. This is only if you'd like to share. If you'd like to uh, just listen to other people's poems, just sit tight wherever you're listening to it right now. But if you'd like to share poems yourself on the open lines, email them to open mic. That's open M-I-C <coughs> at rattle.com. Sorry, I didn't get the cough button. Um, open MIC at rattle.com. Find the Zoom link in the chat windows, uh, which I'm about to deploy right now, and then join us on Zoom. Leave the uh, If you're going to share a poem, leave your stream. Shut that off so there's not two things going because there is a bit of a delay. And find the invite link to um, Zoom and join us on the Zoom after sending the poem. You can send poems about um, anything you'd like. You can send something you published recently. Poets respond poems. You can do um, um, the prompt. And the prompt for this week was from Gene Hall Gailey last week. And that was to uh, pick a villain from popular culture, comic books, fairy tales, etc., and have them respond to the events of the last six years. That was the prompt for this week. So um, so if you have a poem for the prompt, feel free to share it. If you have news poems or if you have poems that you published recently, feel free to share those too at openmic at rattle.com. Uh, so sit tight now. We'll be right back with those, uh, with those poems. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I mentioned right before we went into the break, the prompt for this week from Gene Hall Gailey, last week's guest, was to pick a villain from popular culture, comic books, fairy tales, etc., and have them respond to the events of the last six years, include, if you can, a musical instrument and a favorite food. And um, you know, every time, it's kind of a tradition on the show, I guess this is the third or fourth time someone's had some kind of comic book or like superhero type thing. And I've always done a uh, poetry man poem. He's always battling his uh, his arch nemesis, Professor Prose. And it was hard to think of how you would do um, a poetry man poem or a Professor Prose, prose poem as a poem because he writes in prose. And that's the problem with Professor Prose. But um, it finally occurred to me like a half an hour before the show how I could pull this off. So here is my uh, my poem for this week. It is... It is Professor Prose Explains the Pandemic, but is blocked by Hyben. So here's Professor Prose explaining the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic was a global pandemic of coronavirus disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. The novel virus was first identified from an outbreak in Wuhan, China, in December 2019. Attempts to contain failed, allowing the virus to spread worldwide, causing more than 7 million confirmed deaths, making it one of the deadliest in history. The bands played on from their distant balconies through Thanksgiving. 
That was uh, Poetry Man's response to Professor Prose's attempt to explain the pandemic in the most boring way possible, which I have to admit was mostly just stolen from Wikipedia. Um, anyway, that was my poem for this week. Let's see what everybody else has. And let's go first to uh, T.R. Paulson. Hey, T.R., how are you doing tonight? Good. Can you um, hear me all right and yeah. everything? It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything's great. You look great. You sound great. So uh, what do you have to share? Well, this one, um, I sent, I emailed it earlier, like a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a sonnet I wrote for the Acrostic Challenge in the summer of 2021. The one with the towels on the clothesline. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, the painting. It was like a watercolor, I think, of the towels on the clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I looked up the month and I sent it in the email. And it's now in Main Street Rag. Excellent. Which I I always think of them as a publisher mainly of chapbooks, but they actually have a nice little journal. Mm -hmm. And so I sent it, I submitted it to that. And yeah, they, they do a great they job of the chapbooks. They, they're, I don't know how, I don't know what printer they use to make them perfect bound because our printer can't do it, <laughs> which is why we have the staples. Um, but they're very nicely done, the chapbooks at Main Street Rag. And then uh, they're a yeah, journal too. Yeah, I have yeah. some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's sort of how I discovered that they also do a journal. And yeah. so, um, so the poem, it was actually a spinoff poem from a sonnet series that I'm working on, that I'm still working on, that's still not done, but the spinoff the, the spin poem is already published. So it's interesting that that's how poetry goes. <laughs> that's I, true. <laughs> I really enjoyed the, the um, main reader, David, today. Um, because he's, you know, the way he sort of is writing stories through his poems and the way he uses formal elements, that was so enjoyable to me. And it's sort of ironic because my poem is set in Mexico. Oh, there you go. Well, let's hear it. What, 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 actually, uh, in, actually, actually in Mexico, not just near the border. Wave riding at Puente San Carlos. I salt my hands with ocean every day, a different hue or pattern. Find the lips of waves unbroken, then breaking. I flip my hair in liquid smoke beneath the play of pelicans, make seaweed my bouquet, until the fog swirls like unwritten scripts for love, until the moon silvers and strips and curls on ink beneath the Milky Way. I towel my breasts beneath Orion's shield and dry my thighs in wind-tossed color, wind my hair in night. The mist and desert land are one, I dream I'm chased by someone wild, then held. I want it all, the rocks, the wind, the broken waves, to be my lover's hands. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, Wave Riding at Punta San Carlos uh, from the Main Street Rag. Did you send a second poem, too? Um, that's just oh, I got that's it. all the, I have the same thing for today. Thing okay. Yeah, well, that was wonderful. I always love a sonnet, as you know. Thanks for uh, sharing that, TR. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah. Good to yeah. have a day at work. Yeah, for sure. Like poetry. Yeah, take care. <laughs> um, hang on, I got it. So I apologize to everybody if, um, you know, everybody here has the flu. And um, I was wondering if I was getting it, like, for the last, because my, my Little League team has, uh, there are 14 kids in the roster, five showed up to practice uh, on Friday. And then uh, my son came down with it Saturday, and then I was wondering, like, a little tickle. And then for the last, like, three hours or so, it's definitely here. So I am, like, brain foggy and um, coughing, but hopefully I've hidden it pretty well. Uh, but anyway, if not, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So here uh, next is uh, – let's do Angela Gardner next. <clears throat> Hi, Tim. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Angela? Good. Real good. I, I have, like – all these puppies around me so uh -huh. <laughs> i'm not gonna gonna see off camera hopefully you don't hear any weird odd noises so <laughs> well we definitely love puppies but but that's okay if you don't want to share the puppies uh, what, what yeah i don't want to share, share myself today <laughs> okay <laughs> well, that's <what> <laughs> i'll share the puppies next week <laughs> <laughs> okay we'd love to see them definitely um so so what poems would you like to share though and i should say everybody if you want to do uh i think if there's two short shorter poems it's fine for this week so um <clears throat> sorry feel free yeah, I I actually did a quick um prom poem and then I also I don't know if I read this before, but um 
it's um it's kind of I bought Powerball tickets t- today oh, and really? I wrote a poem a while back about the Powerball, but I don't know if I read it. But if 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 I did, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it might be okay again. I don't when, know. when do they do the actual like like the results? Do you know if you're a billionaire yet? Um, it's ten fifty nine and it's nine thirty four. Um, uh-huh. right now so okay, i'll so know in an so hour could, that i lost we're talking to a potential billionaire right now yeah <laughs> i wish <laughs> i'll let you guys know next week <laughs> okay well i expect more than just letting us know i expect like a tip or something because yeah. we obviously <laughs> helped you along in yours but anyway let's let's hear a poem <laughs> okay. so the first poem was a giant problem um I, I'll just read whenever. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. A giant problem. I fell from the clouds when Jack cut the beanstalk. The town people celebrated with jazz guitars. Little did they know they buried a sleeping giant. I woke up and found the old man selling beans. He was yummy. I found a place to plant the magic seeds in the in a forest next to the mountain. I wanted to climb up to my giant house and wife. I miss her breakfast, eggs, pancakes, and bacon. But the stalk didn't grow any higher than 20 feet. I hid behind trees, covering myself with leaves. People came and took photos, thinking I was Bigfoot. They disappeared for two years, but I still got COVID. (laughs) That's a kind of funny ending. Thanks for sharing that. (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, then we have the the billion-dollar ticket poem, too. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've read this before, but it it's okay. Yeah, I, don't There's a so. billion... I don't think so. Okay. There's a billion dollar ticket somewhere. I rub this silky slip of paper between my fingers, hoping it will be charmed. You can't win if you don't play, Grandpa said. He would sit in his living room recliner, holding the ticket in his hand, waiting for his magic numbers. I think about what a billion would buy. An oddly shaped rocket ride? Or a trip to a polar bear city where I would bring all the fish I can so they wouldn't be skinny? I never got a chance to ask him what he'd do if the pot of money swelled behind, beyond millions. I remember his dead tickets and folded newspapers to be recycled. He knew it was just a dream. Only a lucky one can win. Excellent. Yeah, there's a billion dollar ticket somewhere and there definitely is right now. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Great stuff as always. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night, and maybe I'll win, but yeah. I probably won't. Yeah, good luck, but at least not <laughs> you have puppies, so that, that's yeah. got to count for something. Well, <laughs> I hope your family feels better, too. Yeah, so. yeah, thanks. I hope so, too. Thanks a lot, Angela. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, let's go to Guy Chambers next. <clears throat> Oops, I put the wrong one. There you go. Hey, yeah. Guy. Hey, how you doing, Tim? Good. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a problem poem here but i got this one here that i have been published before down in our i had uh i had to read it on a radio station down in ottawa uh, ontario in canada here and uh, it actually was translated over to iran language because they were trying to promote their promote Mm -hmm. down here in ontario so i got a couple poems published here through there and they translated to they do the translation, then I just read it after that. Oh, very that too, cool. So. Yeah. Yeah, so this one, uh, I always call it a hero. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> if everybody was a hero, tiptoe in the shadows without an echo, standing tall and proud in a crowd. If everybody was a hero, towering with power of the hour, be aware, being there. If everybody was a hero, deep-hearted, bold role, soulmate, avowed and endowed. If everybody was a hero, twofold grown, soulful backbone, thoughtful shine, watchful mind. If everybody was a hero, Lift to it an oath, come to the fourth, give the time when they need. If everybody was a hero, if this could be a status quo, if this could grow, if this could always glow, if this could always be echoes, it would be a better place 
to be. Yeah, that's to say, like, for being a hero, like you say, like, you always think about somebody rescuing somebody from a girl, but the biggest thing is, like, say, being there for somebody, just being for your family or your, just your friends or something, just being there for somebody. That's the biggest thing it's all about. Yeah, It'd for be sure. Two different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah great I got, lesson, guy. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. I got the small one there. There's another one of my micro poems there. Okay, great. Let's hear it. <clears throat> okay. Sad. Words just said. Eyes can't hide what was indeed said. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, always a pleasure. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Guy. Thanks for sharing those. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Yep, take care. Uh, that was Guy Chambers with us, said, and a hero. And let's go to uh, Dick Westheimer next. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dick. How are you doing tonight? Your brain, your brain fog did not come through in the interview. Well, that's but... good to know. It felt a little better, but setting up the show was actually difficult. Like, I was like, what do I, I couldn't remember, like, what I had to do. And it, it, I was, so I was like three or four minutes late because I, what usually takes five minutes took 10. But um, anyway, I'm glad it all worked out. I was yeah, a little well, nervous. That, yeah. yeah. But it was nice that we had a guest um, that could just carry, you know, carry the show and he oh was my great. Goodness. So, yeah. I wrote a note that he's the the hardest working man in Poe business. He might be, yeah, definitely. That's the uh, well. I will I will um, read one poem, and it was on the same subject as um, your Sunday's poem. Yesterday, yesterday's poem. It's, it was my poets respond. Um, one called history lesson. Yeah, you see it it? explain what it's about while I pull it up. Although we kind of know because we talked. Yeah, about we kind of know. It, it's just uh, you know, as as you probably discovered by by your inbox that you know a lot of a lot of Jews are on edge, and not because anybody is particularly at risk, but because you know a thousand year history of of things turning south in a hurry mm-hmm. just makes these things that feel like small aggressions and not really much but uh you always listen for what's on the horizon like that's for sure yeah and it's sort of like right over the horizon that Mm -hmm. that's sort of the visual that i had calm seas i'm fine but we have a history of things being over the horizon being pretty pretty troubling Mm -hmm. so that was um that was the prompt for this poem um history lesson and the um, um, epigraph is from Eli Wiesel from Knight. Uh, and, and just for context, this is his father early in the uh, um, early in the book saying, the yellow star, what of it? You don't die of it. Oh, wow, yeah. History lesson. One, every crack of a gun makes me jump. You'd think I'd get used to it. Rifles around here are as abundant as riding mowers. One neighbor takes target practice on Sundays. His rapid fire after church ritual floods the neighborhood with the blasts and crash of shattered pop bottles. Another takes pot shots at concrete blocks with the most powerful rifle he's got, an AR-50, he tells me. Sounds like a fucking cannon. He says it can take down a human-sized target at a thousand yards. Why would he tell me that? Then he shows me a bullet big as his finger. Holy shit. Two, I was out for a walk today in the neighborhood woods, wading through a carpet of leaves. The shuffling sound was like a mantra, put me at ease. The musky, sweet scent, a meditation in itself. Near dusk, the last of the sunlight slanted through the trees, marked my path with the patterns that make autumn walks such a sigh of relief. Then, boom, not so far off, a single shot echoes from the creek I stop, still as a trapped rabbit, think, someone's coming for me. Seriously. Three. The deer hunters are out with their bows, quiet in their stands. They sit so still and serene, like camo-clad yogis of the grove, beaches and oaks, their company at dawn. Four, there are folks around here ramping up for gun season, early, it seems. My bow hunter friend got me a blaze orange vest for my woods walks. He says, there are crazies out there. 
He meant folks who get drunk and twitchy, take shots at anything that moves. Five, I've read the news, I've heard the views of the influencers, Kyrie and DT, Q and Ye, all trading on the old canards about bankers and globalists and getting high on baby's blood, all ripped from the protocols of the elders of Zion. Deep in the subtweets and from the mouths of Pauls and, the, and in great Caesar's halls, libel the same at what's been leveled for a thousand years. And all I can think about is, again, it may be open season on Jews. Yeah, great poem. And, and there were a lot of poems about that topic. You were right, uh, Dick. Um, <clears throat> at least, um, I don't know, at least 10, I'd, I'd say, from the submissions this week about that subject. And a uh, very important one, too. And also, just to throw in there, I hate honey season gathers. They hunt for, like, the one deer we have. <laughs> Like, we have mule deer. Uh, there's so little water in this these mountains that there's like there's a handful of deer, and yet still the, the woods are full of hunters, and it's just ugh, yeah. Yeah, well, for, fortunately, most of the hunters here are bow hunters, mm -hmm. and there's very sort of strict rules about where they can go. And the bow hunters love the land; they are so gentle on it. Mm. And, oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, these are these people are not. These people are uh, yeah, tracing these, these through drugs with shotguns. For, <laughs> I do not like it. for hours, days at a time mm. in the stands. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'll get a little note from them because we let them use our farm mm -hmm. and say things like, oh, I just saw the sunrise over your creek. You know, they're, they're just, yeah. they're in mm -hmm. love with being out there. Oh, wow. That's interesting. The gun hunters are a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Dick. And, and both things very interesting. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Feel better. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> All right, next let's go to uh, Jerry Stephenson. I'm unmuted. You are. You're right there, oh, Jerry. Good geez. to see you. How are you doing tonight? It's, uh, actually, I'm doing really good. I went through a COVID boat this fall. Ah, yeah. And I got the... COVID brain thing, it came and left me for the last three, four weeks. It's been a real struggle. Oh, yeah. Well, I think this <laughs> is the flu because, uh, you know, supposedly there's a flu, you know, the flu season's yeah. worse than anybody else. We hadn't gotten our flu shots uh. yet. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we need to now because we got the actual you thing. You got it. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and, half, and two thirds of the baseball team did too. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, what is it I, that you got, you got for us, though? I got your prop poem. Oh, I, great. I hit this and it it just, it hit a nerve with me. Okay. And I think, you know, from past stuff I've read you, I really, really like Mr. Peabody and the Wayback Machine. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they got her dialed in. So this is a little different spin on some of the characters in there. And I brought it from a Canadian standpoint because it's, that's what Dudley do right is and all the other characters. So anyways, here we go. It's called, the View South, November 2016. <laughs> so snidely whiplash is eyeballing Nell with a coil of rope next to the railroad tracks. He's chowing down on a plate of poutine. Whilst RCMP inspector Fenwick plays a concertina. That's Dudley's boss. Is this evil attrition unfolds? Where is Dudley Do-Right? To make Snidely shriek, curses foiled again. <laughs> That's right. That makes me want to go watch watch some of that um, classic cartoons. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Maybe with my brain fog, it'd be perfect, uh, perfect entertainment. To it that. works really easy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jerry. That's a, a pleasure as always. Always fun to see you. Hey, good seeing you. Thanks a lot for everything you do, Tim. Yep, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep, that was Jerry Stephenson with The View, South, November 2016. Next up, let's go to uh, Kimberly McNeil. <clears throat> there. Hey, Kimberly. How are you I doing get, tonight? Good. I, hi, Tim. Finally got that to work. Yeah, excellent. I'm so glad you did. So what do you have to share with us? Oh, and you remember not to send it as a pages because, yeah, I should tell everybody every time. I can't open pages files. I have a Mac or I mean, I have a PC and I don't, but, but Kimberly sent it pages and then remembered i think and said it as a doc so thanks for that yeah that did that help that's it good. did definitely so i have it up so so do you want to explain what it's about yeah it's it's um kind of sci-fi-ish it's a make-believe person that i named chemo breath 
Interesting. Okay. And they're, um, they're an egocentric, self-absorbed monster. Interesting. Well, go ahead whenever you're ready. Have it up. Secretly, I hope the toxicity from your chemotherapy would humble your ego. Melt away your rudeness. Annihilate your selfishness. Leave you gray and weak. Give us all a peek of the kinder person dying inside. But chemo breath remained the same refusing to learn from his chemo pain. Unable to grieve, he became the ego dare champion of a new Buddhist game. A smiling assassin gunning for cure, he remained in remission while spreading the fear of him randomly interrupting the euthanistic affair of another unapologetic and without shame, chemo breath fought his anti-euthanasia campaign. Self-absorbed and quick to blame, he remained a sarcastic energy drain to the rare Buddhist he could find who would talk to him. Oh, very interesting as always. Thanks so much for, for sharing that, Kimberly. Thank you. Yeah, always a pleasure. Take care. It was Kimberly McNeil with Chemo Breath. And uh, next up, we will go to um, Julian Matthews is here. Hi, Tim. Hey, Julian. Great to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, so what do you have to share with us this week? I have two. One is called Hollow and another is called Bad Day. Okay, let me pull So up. the first one is... Let me find a... One second. Oh, here we go. Hollow. I have Hollow. Okay. So the first one is based on uh, the, the Joaquin Phoenix movie Joker in 2019. Oh, Santa yeah. Andy. That's a great movie. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's like an anti-villain movie. Yeah, I'd say so. So here goes. Hollow. Maybe you feel lost sometimes, just binging on Breaking Bad on Netflix for the third time. And your playlist of sad bass songs on Spotify is on endless repeat, and you've grown tired of it. Maybe you feel hollow as the likes on Instagram that now have become heartless. Or all the tweeting, the back and forth of gnashing and grating threads left unwound that cannot heal your wounds. Or maybe all the swiping left or even right on Tinder is as cold as this dreary, hazy, starless night scrolling by. You no longer are young. You can almost hear your bones rotting inside of you. Feel it is really getting crazier out there. And the joke is on you. July 4th. November 8th, January 6th, the dates burst in your head like dynamite or fireworks or brown sugar cinnamon Pop-Tarts. And it's getting crazier in your head as the tick-tock, ticking, talking, chattering masses walk on, walk by, walk away, caught up in needy, desperate, shallow pretense. You feel it all rushing past you on the Amtrak like the earth is spinning, churning, yearning, and you just want to get out, get lost, get over it, or maybe... There's no one waiting for you at the next stop or the stop after that or ever. And when you finally get off, it's dark, dank, dead, and you can smell the urine in every corner. You can hear the rats padding nearby and the screeching, squeaking, snitching noise inside your head hurts as the train pulls away like nails on a chalkboard. And you look over your shoulder and just like you've been trained, weary, weary, wired, sometimes not even caring anymore, not wanting to be alone here again, just wishing someone, anyone, would show up just for you and make all this aching inside end. Yeah, powerful poem, Julian. That was great. Great reading of it, too, as always. That was hollow. 
Uh, and then you've got another one too for us. Yeah, the next one is called uh, Bad Day. Is it possible for me to share screen? Um, I think you can, yeah. I might have it here, though, if if that's all you're sharing. Uh, I have some graphics to go with. Yeah, it, go ahead. Yeah, share screen. Oh, maybe I have to set something. Let's see. Security, share screen. Okay, now you should be allowed to share screen, yeah. Okay, here goes. Um, bad day. Today I offer my shoulder as a well to contain all your tears when you are all cried out. Let me be the underground river that floats all your burdens away. When your heart sinks lower than it ever has, let me free dive on a single breath, follow its air bubbles to the bottom to retrieve it. When the sadness pours inside you like a drowning wave, let me conjure up a pea green boat and sailors boat off to sea. Today is a bad day, no owl. No pussycat. All I can offer are these paltry made-up metaphors strung together as hasty, temporary band-aid, frosty comfort amid frustrating pain. I know, I know. Also, you know, today will pass. Knowing doesn't make it any easier. We've had enough bad days to know better, and all these knows and knowing never adds up to a single yes. Blessed are the mothers and fathers. Blessed are the sacrificial caregivers. Blessed are those who have no other options. Blessed are those who endure lengthening bad days. Blessed are those who never see the light of a good day. Only rare moments, fewer and farther between. I pray our day will come. It is just around the next bend, my friend. Past the well of tears, over the river of burdens, above the sea of sunken hearts. Just one sail away on this ocean of sadness. Where one day, one bright night soon... We'll play all in the pussycat again, go hand in hand on the edge of the sand and dance by the light of the moon and dance by the light of the heavenly moon. Thank you. Yeah, that was Bad Day by Julian Matthews. Thanks so much for sharing that, Julian. Uh, just wonderful stuff all around. And uh, <clears throat> I was wondering why... Um, we have the hashtag Julian's Poems, and you've always included the uh, not poetry hashtag, too. How, why not poetry? Because uh, someone very early said uh, when I was writing poems five years ago mm -hmm. that this doesn't sound like poetry. Oh, really? <laughs> That's funny. Well, it definitely sounds like poetry to us. Uh, thanks so much for sharing and reading that, Julian. It's always great. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Uh, the two poems by Julian Matthews. Let's see, Nate Jacob is up next. Oh, Nivedita's here. Let's get Nivedita because it's a weird time for her. And I don't know how long that's going to last. Hey, Nivy, how you doing? Hi, Tim. I'm doing great. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. So it is, uh, what time is it? Are you up super early? Um, No, it's actually 8.30. I'm halfway at work. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's very cool to see you. Yeah. So I was going to play your video, but we have you live, which is even better. So, so how you been? Um, I've been good, thank you. And I've really enjoyed seeing all the shows, as always. Yeah, excellent. And next week's show is going to be uh, the, the earlier time, so it'll be time. easier. Yes, yeah. so I think I can. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll see you two weeks in a row, hopefully. Um, so so what do you have for us this week? Um, a prompt poem, as usual. Mm -hmm. um, I chose, I think, one of the most famous pop culture villains of all time. And probably when I read it, maybe the first two lines will give an idea of who it is. But if not, once it ends, I'll just mention who the person is <laughs> <laughs> okay let's hear it so, no laughing matter this is not a joke with a smile wider than his face and eyes that peers right into you he strums the strings of your thoughts causing your emotions to crumble like a dense heavy souffle but is he the bad guy after all for is that not what we all do are guilty of doing playing with the perceptions and passions of others Oh, very interesting. Yeah. So who is the superhero? Because I have to admit, the reason why I do the poetry mm -hmm. guy is because I don't know superheroes at all. I, when I was a kid, I remember the Green Lantern, but I don't remember who his villain was. I don't know who his superheroes are. So who is this that? Is the villain from Batman. Oh, okay. The Joker? The Joker. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I did see. I did like the uh, the Joker mo the the film that uh, that someone mentioned earlier. 
but um, but comic books were never a thing for me. And the graphic novels, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I know some people love them, and I, David Bowles has wrote some, but <laughs> they're not for me. <laughs> I've read many comic mm-hmm. books or graphic novels, I just, so I think I'm sailing the same boat as you are. Yeah, yeah. I just I like to have my mind's eye being opened and not looking at. Stuff. I like to imagine what it would look exactly. like rather than exactly. Have it. Told yeah. to me. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks so much for for uh, joining us. I'm so glad you could, Nivy. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely seeing you too. Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you. That was Nivy DeCarthic uh, joining us live, uh, which was great. So, uh, and that was her poem, "No Laughing Matter." This is not a joke. Uh, I think we have three. Uh, yeah, we have three left here. Nate Jacob is next. Hey, hey, Nate. Tim. Yeah, how you doing tonight? I've uh, seen worse. I don't have the flu coming on, so. <laughs> yeah, it's been bad for everybody else. So I, I sort of like, you see what's coming. And I can, I feel I have a fever and my, my brain is not working quite right. And I'm coughing, but <clears throat> I know it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And that's part of it. Yeah, uh, we've got anyway. three in my house, so I understand. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what do you got for us? Well, I wasn't going to join the video because I have a, a sore elbow. Oh, no. But hearing that you're sick made me think. Uh, maybe <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, we could do you. it. We could be the the walking wounded. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. How'd you hurt your no, elbow? I just sent you a short tweet. Uh huh. Okay. A haiku. Okay. Uh, about it's a current event poem about the mess that Twitter is right now. Oh yeah. So uh, I'm new to Twitter. Just yeah. joined in September, and I think that kind of marks me on Twitter in some way. <laughs> um, I hate being marked, but here I am. Uh, new guy. So haiku from a new tweeter is the title of the poem. Is it up? I can't tell. Yep, I got it. So just go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, haiku. Displaced birds shelter on a mastodon's back. Breathe deep the new musk. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, for sure. And I'm a new tweeter too. I um, I have my Twitter says I've had it since 2009, I think, because I just get everything right away. But um, right. and then for a couple of years, I was tweeting um, dreams in like American sentences. <laughs> so like every yeah. time I just wake up in whatever dream I had. And that's when I realized my dreams are boring. So after a year of doing that and I just like played baseball every day, I stopped that. And I didn't use Twitter <laughs> for for uh, however many, 10 years. And then July or June, I started using it again. And um, and now it's kind of going to crap. But anyway, that's life. You just I'm clueless and hopeless. <laughs> Twitter included. So yeah, well, aren't we all? But that, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was great. Um, always thanks a pleasure. A great yep. show tonight. Yep. Take care. You too. Nate, Nate Jacob with a haiku from a new tweeter. And uh, let's go next to um, Brent Stauffer. Oh, let's get started. Hey, hey, Brent. Hey, How are you doing tonight? Yeah, great to see you. Oh, I'm doing great. Um, awesome show. Really fascinating interview with a, a, a very inspiring fellow. Yeah, it really, definitely was. Like on a lot of levels. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, uh, and the rest of the, the, the open mic has been excellent, as always. And uh, so what I sent you today, uh-huh. oh, uh, well, yeah. So well, never mind. What I sent you today is a uh, prompt poem um and i sent you two files one is mephistopheles 2 so that's the one that um yeah i got it. i got the revised, the revised the faustian era but it's, it's yeah, the yeah, revised yeah. version yep yeah 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 it's just the title that i changed okay. but the uh the uh the, the title that i came up with first was too on the nose trumpy <laughs> and I didn't want to. I didn't want people to start the poem thinking about Trump or anybody like him. I just well, now you just ruined thousand. that because we're all thinking. About <laughs> oh shoot! I did, didn't I? Well, well, let's just. Let's it's just, not. Uh... It's not aimed. It's not aimed specifically at Trump, uh-huh. which is yeah. So keep that in. Okay. Mind. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Yep. Okay, the Faustian era. <clears throat> Thin as smoke, Mephistopheles came to me in a dream. Perched on the edge of the bed, cranked his lanky legs, leaned back and said, what happened to you, man? You used to have all kinds of ambition. Examined a fingernail, sighed and looked away. I don't know, maybe it's me. After all, I've been so busy, too many clients these days. 
I miss our nightly negotiations. It's not liars and pomegranates anymore. Now it's just power. Raw and plain. No imagination. Grimaced like a locomotive. Shifted like a gathering storm. You any idea how many regimes I'm propping up this moment? Of course you do. It's so blatant and all done out in the open. Peered over his bony shoulder toward me and smiled sadly. His mouth filled with dead honeybees. Oh, what a great image at the end. That was great. The Faustian era. Yeah, very powerful there at the end. Thanks so much for sharing that, Brett. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Oh, and pomegranate is not actually my favorite food or one of my favorite foods uh-huh. as per the the uh, but the 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 um the prompt was it is a food yeah that's true because <laughs> the prompt the, the prompt wanted you to incorporate also a musical instrument and your favorite food mm-hmm. which i thought was such an interesting um uh quirk to it, the challenge it was so yeah. i appreciate it it, it was too that's okay, why anyway, my little, that's little haiku i got the uh the uh, band, and then uh, I was thinking about kids eating band aids. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thanks, Brett. That was great. Okay. Yep. Talk thanks to you later. a lot. Bye. Bye. It was Brent Stoffer with the Faustian era. Um, and last on the open lines uh, on the Zoom, we have um, uh, Jayanti Rangan. So let's pull up Jayanti. Hey, Jayanti, how are you doing tonight? Good, Tim. Um, uh, I guess you can hear me today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely can. You're all set and uh, you're live. Okay. Yeah, and the air, everything's great. Okay. Um, so I wrote a haiku, but uh, this one, it's about, um, I don't know whether everyone remembers this person, with Trump, who's in jail now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, uh, this haiku is called uh, Cruella. Uh-huh. Um, she styled his garb, not fancy furs, but prison orange. Reinventing was her skill. Oh, that's great! <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that, Jyanti. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. You too. Yeah, that was Cruella by uh, Jayanti Rangan. And that was our last uh, person on the Zoom. So I'm going to shut down the Zoom, say goodbye to everybody. We have a couple more poems to read before we wrap up the show. <clears throat> and um, we have one from Carlton Johnson. So uh, let's pull this up. And uh, Carlton Johnson says, This is not a poet respond poem. It is just a poem I wrote recently. Since it is short, I'm including a second related poem. So uh, here's Carlton Johnson, two quick poems. Uh, I'm always happy to share these. This is Before Bed by Carlton Johnson. Uh, Before Bed. This is the time when your feet, your eyes, your mind are crying to lay down in the rich, soft underbelly of sleep, cashing in what little time remains. And yet you stay up in spite of your shaky desire, your bleary-eyed view of tomorrow to have one more, just one more breath on the page before departing. Oh, that was great. I love the uh, the rich, soft underbelly of sleep. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Carlton. And then the second poem is Sometimes. Sometimes I dream, often I daydream, sometimes I nightmare. The day-to-day reality, a growing pleading to do more but what? I imagine an army of poets, actors, artists, clamoring for better lives, cleaner air, safer towns, better water, more caring. And yet, who am I? Just an older dude with a keyboard typing, wishing for a crusade, one where no one dies or suffers the pain of a spear or a battle axe, but nonetheless is struck dumb by the not doing. Had two interesting poems. Thanks so much. It was Sometimes and Before Bed by uh, Carlton Johnson. Thanks for sharing those, Carlton. And uh, we also have a poem by, um, let's see, we also have a poem by, Danny Mask has another one, um, and this is, uh, this is another Danny Mask poem. I'm not sure if this is a prompt. He says, here's another one, so let's just read it. This is uh, Danny Mask with, uh, it starts out with vitamin C. So here we go. 
Vitamin C. In the second grade, a girl with reddened eyes stood with locked knees, expecting the worst. Behind her, a wall-to-wall chalkboard, and all of us with small, puzzled faces watching. Watching her as a sizable squirt of water splashed down her toothpick legs from under her pink flower dress. Under her feet like a mirror, her pool of pee reflected sunbeams all over the room, and that girl who stood in the puddle was gone. Reflecting pool. From Maysville Elementary, 1959. Thanks so much for sharing that, Danny, too. Uh, excellent stuff, as always. And um, here's Ted Guevara's villain poem. And he gives us an image like he usually does from the movie Collateral, which I think I might have seen. I think there's like some kind of assassin guy. Is that the one with um, in a cabbie? Anyway, this is the, the still, uh, the, the poster from Collateral. Um, which which he included, and here is uh, Ted's poem, and in just a second while I cough again. Okay, um, here's Collateral, and uh, here is Ted's poem, Tubes of Red. He would seek peace when he's done um, with a list, but never before. Before is an upholstered seat with a lifeless body, content with the evening. There's nirvana in what he chambers in the gun. Chinatown boss, cartel imp, a judge, a lady lawyer. Each one has their name on a cold bullet. Only the morning could give them singular odd. For Vincent also paints, and the night is his canvas. He must lighten the dark with red. Going out of line is evil, more malefic than his precise soul. Beauty doesn't depend on the bleed of colors, on the palette only owns, for the palette only owns scarlet. Even when a body drops and splats on the car top, red is contained. Vincent cleans methodically within the chalk line. In the strobe light, garnet blurs nothing. Vincent's aim sifts through all the moving parts till it finds its point, puncturing another vessel of crimson. And when a woman is in the equation, Vincent respects within edges, but only pursues a deeper red. And there was tubes of red. And that definitely is the movie I saw, Collateral with uh, Tom Cruise is the villain, um, Vincent. Yeah, it all comes back to me now. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. Very cool poem. Um, I think that is it. Let's see. Hmm. Interesting. So, ah, so JB wants to be anonymous. This was from last week. Remember last week we had a poet who was just going by, just had the, JB poems in the subject line. And I didn't want to read a poem without giving credit. Um, and so apparently that was what JB wanted to do. So I assumed it was a mistake, but it actually wasn't. So um, JB wants to go by JB pen name and have me read this poem uh, from last week, Dead Men Smell No Quails. So here we go. This is JB pen name, which is a really cool pen name, I have to say. JB pen name with Dead Men Smell No Quails. Here we go. Dead men smell no quails. A man left the house. I'm going out today, he said to the house. Immediately, as he said this, the curb of the street stepped on his big toe. It's okay, said the man, consoling the pavement. I'm going out to the park. I'm going to see the quails. It was then that the combo chicken he ate the night before found its way down his pant leg. Never worry, the man said to the ghost of his briefs, to the wet of his thigh. Just think of the quails, beautiful beautiful quails. A rare poisonous spider from out of town came up in a bad mood and bit the man on the heel. The man kneeled over dead. Do you think death would stop me? The dead man's face asked the ground. The ground had nothing to say, so the dead man dragged himself along by his teeth, leaving a trail like a mollusk, if a mollusk could drool or bleed from the spot where its nose had just been. The dead man's body came to a beach and forgot where it was heading. Ah, at last, I've reached the beach, he said to the shards of his mouth. The shards echoed back to him like waves pushing the sand. Now, where are those gulls? Beautiful, beautiful gulls. That is a really cool, that was a, that was, we were looking for spooky poems for Halloween last week, remember? And that was Dead Men Smell No Quails. That was a wonderful, creepy, uh, uh, creepy and strange, surreal type poem. I, one of my favorite books, um, I think it might be on the shelf there because I put some of my favorite books on the shelf now that we have a shelf right behind me um, is Sudden Fiction, um, which is really, really short stories. 
And um, that reminds me of some of the stories in there. The really cool Dead Men Smell No Quails by JB Penname, which is just great. So thanks for sharing that, JB. I'm sorry we didn't do it last week when it was the show, but that was great. And um, that is going to be it for the uh, open lines. Let's do really quickly the haiku or the saiku. And the saiku for this week is right here. It is based on this story. Um, This is from uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine. And uh, this is an article I happen to come across. This says, Vitamin D deficiency increases mortality risk in the UK Biobank, a nonlinear Mendelian randomization study. And uh, what they did is they just looked at the, the Biobank, which is this wonderful system they have in the UK. Since they have the nationalized healthcare system, they have data on everybody, and the whole world uses it to do studies and to see what's going on. And what they did is they took... Uh, people that were low in vitamin D in um, in the data bank from back in between here it is between March 20, 2006 and twenty ten, which was three hundred seven thousand patients, um, which is just huge big data. It's just wonderful because they have this huge bank of information you can learn from. And um, anyway, they took the uh, the patients that had low vitamin D between the ages of thirty seven and seventy three, and then they see if they were still alive um, fifteen fourteen years later. And um, they found that basically the people low in vitamin D, um, there's a 25% chance they were more likely dead. And they called this article actually um, um, evidence of um, causality. I'm not sure it is, although I believe that the causality is real um, because vitamin D is a hormone that does so much for the body and we need to make it. But but, but it shows a a correlation, a very strong correlation anyway, because it still could be that the people that have health problems end up low in vitamin D anyway. Anyway, that's the article. I wasn't really happy with the uh, the study, but that was something I was looking at this week in a very busy week. So um, that's why I decided to write a haiku about, and or the saiku was right here. Half a hike hiding from the sun, the other rain. Half a hike hiding from the sun, the other rain. That is my Saiku for the week, and that is the show for the week. Thanks, everybody, as always, for joining us. It was really wonderful. It was great that we had uh, David Bowles, just a wonderful guest. So much he had to share in those uh, two books he was talking about. He also had a prompt for us, and the prompt for this week is... Oh, no, did I mess it up? Did I put it in the wrong place? I think I put the prompt in the wrong place. Okay, so I'm going to have to hang on one second, one second. I have to pull up the prompt. See, I told you the brain fog. I was trying to set this up right before the show, and it wasn't working. So um, here is his actual prompt, um, and I'll just have to read it because I can't get it in here without showing his address. So um, here's the prompt. Think about the geographical place that says home to you, its flora and fauna, the distinctive shape of the land and the buildings there rooted, the people who feel like family and community, whose tongue shape sounds like your own. Then, even in so simple a form as a list, draw the most distinctive of those elements together and show, in hints or explicitly, how you are partly contingent on those specificities, how you emerge from that milieu. So a very fascinating prompt for, um, uh, from David Bowles. That is uh, his prompt for this week. I'll post it. It's a long, complicated prompt. I'll post it for sure, like we do every week on uh, rattle.com slash rattlecast. Um, and I'll also put it in the show notes wherever you're listening or watching to this in just a little bit. So um, you get a chance to read it too. But basically, take a geographical place that's home to you. Um, list out the things that are there that make it feel like home. And then uh, and then draw elements together to show how you are partly contingent on those details. So very fascinating prompt and very related to what his work is like. That was David Bull's prompt for next week. And next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be... On David James. Now, we've been publishing David James for such a long time. And, um, you know, we have a minute to let me read a David James poem or share a David James poem. Um, Because why not? I should start. It's one of the things I keep thinking I should do more is uh, share an actual poem from the poets when we can. And um, one of my favorite poems that we've published is a David James poem. He does these. um, He does these. Uh, prose poems, like the pro- poem we were looking at before. He does other work, too. Um, let me pull up one of my favorites. It's from The Best of Rattle. It was one of the early poems. And I have to keep scrolling. Hang on just a second. Let me find this, though. Yeah, How to Make Amends. I love How to Make Amends. 
So um, here's How to Make Amends by David James, next week's guest. And this was from Rattle number 25, The Best of Rattle. Originally published um, a couple issues before that. But here's How to Make Amends with by David James. How to Make Amends He was hungry, so he ate the couch, the one with the pull-out bed. Of course, when his wife came home, she was disgusted. Now what will we sit on, asshole? Last week it was the coffee table. The week before, two kitchen chairs and a lamp. What next? The bed? He hadn't thought of eating the bed, but the idea was appealing. It probably would taste like sleep, comfort food. He couldn't respond to her. She was always right. So he went upstairs to lie down. Somehow the bed knew what was coming. It shivered in fear. The man stroked the mattress, saying, Don't worry, I won't eat you, I promise. As the bed settled down, the man fell asleep and dreamed of eating the bed. Mattress, baseboard, springs, pillows. He stuffed everything in his mouth, chewing, crunching, swallowing until he could no longer stand up. He laid there on the floor in the bedroom. When his wife came home after work, she undressed, climbed on top of him, slid under some loose sheets, and slept. His chest rose and fell in time to her steady breathing. Wrapping himself around her, he knew she would be next. He would eat her, and finally there would be peace between them, which was all he ever really wanted. That was David James with How to Make Amends from round number 25. And that, that line, uh, it would probably taste like sleep. That's one of those lines that just randomly pops into my head like 20 years later. Um, as I think just the imagination of that poem is really fun. Um, that's David James. His newest book um, is with, just without a re- out of reach. But uh, his newest book is... Maybe I can reach it. Hang on one second. If I move this... I don't, I just don't want to spill stuff. Uh, there we go. So his newest book is Alive... Um, alive in your skin while you still own it, and also wiping stars from your sleeves. Those are the two new books by David James. He's going to be next week's guest on the Rattlecast, and that is going to be a special time like we mentioned a little bit before. It's going to be an early show because my Little League had a game scheduled that Monday, and I didn't notice it until um, it was too late to cancel, really. Um, so that is uh, going to be an early show, noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. If you're in Europe or in India, it's a much better time for you, I know. So hopefully we'll have some guests from over there as well on the open lines. That's going to be next week's guest, though, um, David James for Rattlecast number 168. And that prompt, which I'll post in the show notes from David Bowles, tonight's guest. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.